Chapter Twenty Two of The Favor of Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Favor of Kings by Mary Hastings Bradley. Chapter Twenty Two. The Marchioness of Pembroke. If on that windy March day, when Anne Boleyn with Henry on the hill had looked over Epping Forest to far away London spires, and beheld in ambitious vision the acclaiming city greeting her as queen, she could have seen how tortuous and baffling was the ascent that she must climb towards her dream city. She might have taken a longer moment's thought before she flung Henry her high confidence, yes. Could she have seen the uneasy hours, the anxious plans, the sharp reversals of hope she was to know? every corner turned seemed but to reveal a new corner fate had always some new tricksy card to play against her nearly five years and a half had passed since that day in epping forest and it was two years since wolsey had died and still anne's position remained practically the same a strange pinnacle of anomalous triumph and thwarted hope in her moments of despondency she told herself that she had not advanced one inch she had scored tremendously to be sure she had remained at court in spite of all the european agitation against her and all the pope's fulminations and catherine and mary had been sent away but after all that was merely holding her own and the throne seemed as far away as ever and now as she sat at the king's side one september night in fifteen thirty two at a banquet given in honour not alas of her coronation but of her elevation to the title of marchioness of pembroke she knew that the throng which smiled so deferentially upon her was busy with wonder over the meaning of this honour which had been conferred upon her was it a fresh step toward the crown or did it mark the end of her ambitions only the newly made marchioness herself could have told and her smiling lips did not part over the information to her father's suavely insinuating i am glad dear anne at your wisdom in contenting yourself with this safe title she returned a mild i am so glad at your gladness which aroused but did not answer the earl of wiltshire's uneasy suspicions concerning his unquiet daughter to carew she was more enigmatic still a fair resting-place dear marchioness he had smiled and she smiled back a resting-place indeed "'Twill be rest for the journey on, she meaneth, interpreted Helen Sackville, who had overheard this, to the old dowager duchess of Norfolk and Wyatt, who were sitting at table near. "'She will be stopped by no sop of marchioness.' "'Tis a good enough sop,' returned the old duchess, her eyes twinkling. "'A thousand pounds in land and a royal present of jewels taken from the queen.' "'The queen,' Wyatt repeated absently. Poor old soul, where is she? Let our dear Marchioness hear you say that, Helen laughed. Why, the lady is at St. Albans still, for all I've heard, scribbling away to the Pope and the Emperor. Do you think Anne will e'er stop at Marchioness? Do you think she will e'er let Queen Catherine come back to court? Then you know not our lady arrogance. Fate is not always of our patterning, Wyatt reminded her. Anne may not have to shape her destiny to her liking more than the rest of us The old Duchess gave the young poet a kindly quizzical look Still sighing Tom There be many in like case he laughed back and his eyes rested on the tall thin figure of the Earl of Northumberland crossing the hall The young Earl looked older than his years and the lines of disappointment were deep about his features the three watched as an acquaintance accosted him Northumberland's manner was perfunctory but absent and with a vague wave of his hand he passed on He seemed to come to rest nowhere roaming ceaselessly from group to group though He was not seen to approach that one where Anne was holding court Another moth the poet said lightly while the Duchess murmured Henry the unlucky he dares not pluck up spirit to accost her. He is still afraid of that late plot Wyatt raised his brows plot good lord where have you been mooning tom that, that you have heard not twas a month ago mayhap too just at the close of warham's life 
it seemeth that earl there cannot abide the wife that his father forced upon him and has no more to do with her than he has with me if account be true if account be true and when one night she came pattering to his chambers and reproached him with neglect he turned roundly on her and declared she was no wife of his and he owed her no duty that he had long ago been betrothed to anne boleyn and no bonds would hold and no other bonds would hold la la the lady countess was in a fine tutu she wrote it all to her father thinking to obtain her freedom from such matrimony and also thinking that her father would be glad to put a stone in the path of the king and anne for every one knoweth that shrewsbury is not the complacent courtier that his words appear but shrewsbury is no fool and his head and shoulders are not yet eager to part company he attempted no deception but showed the letter to norfolk who showed it to his niece who showed it at once to the king and with her usual high-handedness anne denied it flatly and called on northumberland to deny it too all of which on oath he very properly did so the countess of northumberland has still a cold and absent husband and there is no pre-contract between our sovereign and his marchioness so you had not heard that tale oh the weakling the thrice damned weakling wyatt muttered with a hard look at the earl the duchess snorted marry what would you have him do go run his head into the lion's mouth with his babble of pre-contract henry would snap off that head on some pretext or other be sure of that and then would anne be free again weakling indeed what wouldst thou have done my all to save her save her from a crown tom wyatt thou art a madman take this fresh flagon here and drown thy sorrows in drink drinking to the new marchioness said a quick voice behind them and sir nicholas carew lounged to the table where the three were sitting here boy another flagon we'll all join that toast eh ladies to the marchioness of pembroke and her heirs holding his glass on high Wyatt's finely attached brows drew together in unconquerable disdain of the ribald jester. Carew saw it and laughed loudly. Zounds, Tom, be not so squeamish. The king himself have drunk the to hath drunk that toast three times already. I and the lady herself, I warrant you. To be sure she hath, Wyatt answered evenly, a set smile on his handsome lips. We all drink to it then, to the Marchioness of Pembroke and her heirs the future kings of england eh hey, not so fast not so fast thy imagination outstrips the circumstance dear poet those heirs will be no heirs of england marked you the patent of creation bequeathing the title to her heirs male and leaving out those words lawfully begotten that are wont to be used ho 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 carew hiccupped it was a pertinent omission a most pertinent omission i think our lady kite will fly in lower skies hereafter and i think thy health would scarce improve and she heard thee so name her babble it to her then carew gave impudently back and like a flash wyatt's hand flew out and struck carew across the mouth that for thy words then as carew reached for his blade thou canst not draw here wyatt reminded him come outside your venomed blood will be the cooler for a little letting outside it is so oh, ho a worthy quarrel the good name of the heirs of pembroke helen clutched at the duchess's sleeve we must stop them she gasped and the duchess looking up for helen was a tall girl saw that her thin face was ashen caro is a devil with his sword so there sits the wind queried the old lady with an interest not unspiced with malice tut tut we cannot stop them if nicholas is the old nick himself why tom is two devils in his present mood lord his love for anne is like a fever in his blood it never cools think you ever to console him girl for our dark marchioness helen made a sharp effort at recovery i am like to she gave back with her mocking smile thou art like to indeed the old duchess succeeded with a frankness not unkindly poor girl i have oft wondered what you bleak visaged maids got out of life you play in your youth that part of onlooker which we play in old age 
and without our memories to feed you and so you must needs set your hopes upon a star ah wyatt there ah well a day if you wish to serve wyatt tell the tale of this clash to our lady yonder and win him a smile for it helen sackville's light eyes sparkled with an indescribable glint that is indeed the best i can do for him she said pluck up you see he reappears and not a whit the worse the duchess cried presently in a tone of relief that denied the nonchalance of her former air i trust you have not run him through she whispered to the young man who reappeared by her side the devil take him for a drunken fool wyatt retorted viciously he had made but one lunge when i sent his sword flying and he stumbled and went flat on his face i cannot spit a brawler in a ditch his fellows are washing him up he'll be in for the dance later i'll be bound the old lady laughed gaily at his angry accents be philosophical tom another time you may be drunk yourself and not so nice of honour twas but a straw of a quarrel anyway you cannot go about running through all those who prophesy that the heirs of pembroke will not be the heirs of england i am one of them myself she finished hardily looking him determinedly in the face and then she let fall slowly and so i doubt not is our fair marchioness herself wyatt dropped his eyes from that significant look which seemed resolved to drive the truth home to his repugnant senses he thought as he made his way across the hall where the servants were beginning to take up the tables in clearance for the dance how bitter a trickster life was to lavish all else but the heart's desire without which the rest was as nothing he had an impulse to vent his despairs on anne to taunt her to implore her to do any of a thousand follies but when presently he was dancing with her he held his tongue any word that he could utter seemed strangely impotent in the face of that glittering assurance of hers suddenly anne stopped your arm she put a hand on it tis wet tis blood it hath not soiled thee her look flashed over his seeing for the first time how white his face and how tense the lines about the ironic smile come hither at once she imperiously commanded and hurried into the anteroom that lay between the great hall and a small privy garden sir francis weston sat there at dice with a page fresh water said anne briefly and they vanished now roll up thy sleeve who was it did this tis but a scratch he protested and indeed the wound that her hands revealed was not a great matter though a painful one dear cousin nicholas and i had a brief spat he grinned and she returned now i love thee for that and set about bathing it with the water which young weston brought who vanished again with a cheery wink at wyatt she bound her handkerchief about the arm and tied it in place with three or four long dark hairs of hers drawn from her heavy curls now dance no more she commanded wyatt stood looking down at the dark hairs with an indescribable expression then he smiled what would henry say to this it matters little she tossed her head in buoyant confidence what was the quarrel on the good name of the heirs of pembroke he let fall slowly the hot blood rushed into her cheeks she reared her head with a gesture of proud challenge that matter needs no sword to defend it she flashed no cousin he said sadly taunting yielding to the impulse to turn on her some of the bitterness she had given to him no cousin the crown and sceptre will do that the years pass and you are as far from that crown as ever not so how can you say that why i was never so near as now perhaps you mistake the coronet of pembroke for the crown her nostrils quivered i mistake nothing i tell thee it is almost reached why so you said when wolsey died that is two years gone by and so it would have been if warham that mad archbishop of canterbury had not turned from us in his last sickness and refused to pronounce on the case who could have foreseen why he was with us hand in glove at first but now he is gone and the next archbishop she paused significantly her eyes dilating with the triumph she pictured oh yes cranmer wyatt supplied with an impatient gesture of his well arm 
You build on him, but as soon as he is installed he will cool like the others and shirk the responsibility of taking the head of England's cases from the Pope. Nay, he will not cool. Oh, you dream, you dream, said Wyatt thickly. The wine he had drunk, the pain he was suffering, combined to raise him to a pitch of strange excitement. You are stuffed full of dreams by your sly new secretary, Cromwell, and you can find a priest to wed you. What of the king? Will he dare it, think you? I can make him dare, said Anne, and a significant smile touched her eyes and lips as she faced the poet's angry questions. Wyatt, as he gazed on that proud face, was suddenly maddened with a sense of its changes. He remembered the ball years before, where he had suffered so at thoughts of her dishonour and where one look into her eyes had reassured him past all doubt, her eyes that now sparkled with such daring implications. She would play now for higher stakes than any she had risked in the past. Those defiant eyes told him. They did not shrink before the accusing look he returned on her. They challenged arrogantly, and her reckless smile deepened. "'Oh, God!' said Wyatt in a sudden voice of fury, and he clasped her about the waist. I know what is in thy mind. She stared at him, her two hands struggling with his clasped ones. Leave me go, Wyatt. Art thou mad? I hate to injure that cut arm, but leave me go. Tom, art thou drunk? With more than wine, he said savagely. Leave thee go. That had always been thy plea of me, and I have been the fool to grant it. Never now. I have let thee go too long. What if I be married? Is not Henry so? and am not I the truer lover? He will devour thee, Anne, and then cast thee aside. I will wear and cherish thee, but I will not let thee go. His voice came pantingly, for she was struggling with fury. Wyatt was a strong man, and now his strength was inflamed. He held her close. Fool, she flung at him. Henry comes, hear you not his voice? Thou art undone. Free me, I demand. Never. I will hold you and cry that you are mine. He will leave you then. I will save you. You will destroy yourself and me. She was in terror. Henry's laughter was on the other side of the door. Now it was pushed open. That instant Anne stiffened in Wyatt's arms. Her head fell back on his shoulder. Her hands dangled limply. He was grasping her in amazement when the king's eyes fell upon the tableau. In heaven's name! cried Henry. Water came faintly from Anne's lips. Henry's sister, Mary, the Duchess of Suffolk, rushed to the silver ewer on the table, reddened with Wyatt's blood, and stared on it in distraction while Henry sprang to the girl's side. She wavered forward and half shifted her weight to his outstretched arms. It is nothing, she murmured raising her eyes with a palpable effort to the king who clasped her and called for water and wine and Dr. Butts in tipsy confusion. I was but giddy. The sight of blood on Wyatt's arms, it overcame me. Call the physician for him. And then, from under her lowered lids, her eyes swiftly darted a triumphant and commanding message at the bewildered Wyatt. His enlightenment was vivid. He shook himself as if awakening from a dream, and with a dreary return to the resignation of every day. "'I will remove my bloodied arm,' he said in a strangely tired voice, "'but I trust, Your Highness, that I have been the cause of no serious indisposition to Lady Pembroke.' "'It is past,' Anne murmured. "'Doth it not seem to you,' said the Duke of Suffolk, in a harsh undertone to young Weston, who had hurried into the room at the noise of the commotion, "'that a long time elapsed before the lady was so overcome?' She had time to grow used to that bloody arm. Certes, it was near a quarter hour ago when I saw you going into that chamber with that ewer. You mistake, my lord, Sir Francis said. It was but a moment ago. The duke's eyes snapped. He smiled jeeringly. Thy rich bride, then, hath not displaced thy former shrine. Shrine, my lord, is a good word, said the young man in a trembling voice. For the reverence that I bear the Lady Anne. Well prated, uttered the duke, and turned on his heel. I am better, Anne declared presently, and began to dry concernedly her water-splashed gown. Dance but the next dance with me, Hal, and I am cured. 
Nay, rest here with me, the king began thickly. Drunk? Drunker than Wyatt, she said to herself with a shiver of repugnance, while outwardly she smiled and shook her head, insisting on the public room and the dance. She had saved Wyatt from the consequence of his folly. Now she must save herself from Henry's. Truly the Marchioness of Pembroke had cause for that deepening line between her arching brows and the mocking jangle of her laughter. End of chapter 22、Chapter、23 She knew well why Henry had omitted those words from her patent of title. She knew what he was more and more demanding of her, and she, she alone, knew how increasingly difficult denial was becoming. Every time the wretched battle was fought out between them, she surrendered something something of pride, something of resolution. Sometimes she half promised under the strength of his insistence, sometimes she half named a day, but on the morrow, Stopping her ears with her pretty fingers, she would protest that he had dreamed, that he was in his cups, that she had ne'er breathed such a scandalous word. La la, had he no notion of her virtue after all these years. But such subterfuges ceased to avail her, and her continual refusals irritated the king to dangerous estrangement. His wild roisterings in disguise through the town grew more and more frequent, and though his masquerades were cloaked and hidden from the girl, the report of them found their way to her and terrified her with keen forebodings. His reproaches increased, and there came one day when he flamed to passionate anger and flung out of her presence, hurling back words of rage and fury. Never had he so turned upon her. There was strange fear in the heart of the Marchioness of Pembroke. As she leaned back against the cushions of the casement, she had come, she thought, trembling to the crossroads. Her resources were almost at an end. Love me? he had scoffed, his face livid. You would not risk for my love what other women lavish on a groom of the chambers. Is it my crown alone you love? His anger, she knew, had been the anger of a thwarted will. It marked the stress of his desire for her. But it marked, too, the end of his patience with her cajoleries. His words had swept round her like a blustering wind. She had been shaken, not at his reproaches, but at the menace of the attitude they betrayed. He was infuriated, desperate. He was going to console himself. Well, tomorrow would see him back, repentant. But what of the morrow after that, when it was all to do over again? This was not the way she could afford to quarrel with him. Henry's pride and self love were engaged as well as his passion, and he was not a man who brooked denial long. For six years now he had taken it from her, but he was souring. If he grew indifferent, if she lost him. The girl shivered. Then she threw the thought away as too absurd. Henry indifferent? But they could not go on like this forever. As she sat there alone in the room, her chin in her hand, her dark eyes heavy with anxieties, The thought that had slipped some time ago, shamefaced and sly, into the back of her mind, edged more and more into the open. She had mockingly faced Wyatt with the hint of it at the ball last September. But that was a vastly different matter from acting upon it. But now what if she did? What if she played her last card? Her precious card? Herself? It was strangely, sadly significant of the callousness of the life she knew that the desperate concern of this woman now on the brink of self betrayal was with the political expediency of her course. Would it wreck or make her ambition? Feverishly she resolved the aspect of her affairs. Cranmer was to be Archbishop of Canterbury in Warham's place, Warham who had turned so against them in his last days and had checked them so long. Cranmer was a devoted adherent of hers, yet should his loyalty to the royal wishes ever flag, there was a way, as she had hinted to Wyatt, to spur it. For Cranmer had contracted a secret marriage, 
as so many of the English parochial clergy did, and should he now, after accepting this high position where the Romish rule of celibacy could be severely enforced, oppose the king, Henry could pretend to discover the marriage and pack him off to the tower. So on all counts Cranmer could be depended upon. And then there was Cromwell, that Cromwell who had flashed so comet-like above the other satellites at court. Cardinal Wolsey had first made the man who had been until he entered the cardinal's service a small London attorney and money-lender, and upon the cardinal's disgrace Cromwell had managed to make himself. He had interceded for his former master and made many friends for himself by the distribution of the cardinal's pensions. He had hastened to secure the patronage of the Duke of Norfolk, and by shrewd and indefatigable efforts he had come into the royal notice. From Wolsey, Cromwell had learned the lesson of service well, and he applied every wit in his hard bullet head to furthering the king's desires. And since Anne was the chief of these desires, he concentrated upon serving her. Anne felt she might rely upon his intrepid support. "'I'll unmake him, and he hang back,' she breathed to herself. So with these men to aid her, and Warham's opposition gone, the way was clearer in England than she had seen it in long years. If only Henry, smarting from the Pope's defections, could be made to give the decision over to England. He will, she pondered, and I dare. Her face grew sharp and defiant, her mouth fixed and seemed to tighten, her eyes stared out belligerently on the empty room. I dare not she whispered to herself, and then in a strangled voice, I dare. She grew aware at last that her clasped hands were clutching each other so tightly that the rings were cutting into the flesh. She drew off the ring from the sharpest cut. It was one of Henry's earliest gifts to her, a plain gold band with Thy virtue is thy honor, graved within it. What a man for pious sentiments, she thought mockingly, her lips curling in disdain. Her virtue, God alone knew how she had hugged that comfort to her smarting pride against the secret sneers she divined about her. Yet now, the ring slipped from her fingers and rolled out across the floor. A bit of rush blocked it, and it toppled and dropped through an open knothole. The augury seemed to her complete. She laughed. Then something, like a hand upon her throat, seemed to strangle the laughter at its source, and she quivered back among the cushions, her hands hiding her face, like some poor shamed thing. That year the Christmas revels were gayer than ever, and King Henry was scarce an instant to be parted from his marchioness. The dark dawn of the 25th of January saw a little group of people slipping into an unfrequented attic in the west turret of Whitehall. They were the king's most confidential attendants, two ladies from the suite of the Marchioness of Pembroke, and an excited old dowager duchess trembling with cold and elation. The Augustinian friar stood by the altar, and before him knelt the king of England and a slender girl whose dark hair fell in an obscuring shower about her. Against its ebony her face was the pallor of snow, but her eyes were glowing with hot ecstasy. The hand that Henry clasped was cold, but it did not tremble, and she repeated the vows with silvery distinctness. The friar pronounced them man and wife. As Anne rose, the blood rushed into her face. It glowed rosier and rosier like the dawn, and her eyes were luminous as she flung a look about that hushed and awestruck gathering as glancing as the light. At last her soul was whispering within her. With many urgent whispers and reiterated cautions, the company stole out as secretly as it had entered to meet again at breakfast, with as excellent an air of unconsciousness as could be assumed. "'Let but a breath of this out,' warned the Earl of Wiltshire to his reckless son, now the Viscount Rockford, and we'll have the devil on us. All depends upon Cranmer being made archbishop, and the Pope hath not yet ratified that and let him but suspect that Cranmer is a king's man, and that Henry stands in urgent need of his archbishop's aid, and there will be no ratifying. Meanwhile, replied the young Viscount Rockford, with a grin, the nuncio from the Pope is here endeavouring to have Henry arranged to submit to the authority of the Holy See. He hath not an inkling of the matter. 
Oh, for once England hath pulled the wool over papal eyes. We have scored in truth. Wait till tis out, Wilshire foreboded. But even Wilshire's courage had risen with the amazing event. Anne was actually married. And nobody could say that he, Wilshire, had urged the marriage. Rather, it had taken place in spite of him. Anne and Henry, between them, had carried things with a high hand, and he had become the father-in-law of a king. With a smile of paternal pride, he realized that this marriage had always been in Anne's mind, and that she had effected it single-handed, except for the aid of Henry's infatuation. What a man she would have made! But would she? No, he amended, she was feminine to her fingertips. She could bewitch and thrall, command, but she would never have bent to the obsequious flattery that the men at court must yield. She was best a woman. For some weeks the secret was fairly well kept while the way was being paved for its reception. But hints of it began presently to transpire. Anne lived in almost royal state, and at a great dinner that she gave the end of February, Henry called jovially down the board to the dowager Duchess of Norfolk, bidding her observe all the rich plate that belonged to Anne, and asking if she were not a good match. The witticism flew like wildfire through a court already alight with curiosity. And it was no great surprise, a fortnight later, to hear a sermon in the king's own chapel, in which the priest earnestly exhorted his sovereign to eschew the abominable sin in which he lived with Catherine of Aragon, and marry now a good and virtuous woman, even if she were of a lower degree than his own. Somers, the king's jester, parodied the sermon for a week, and Patch, Wolsey's old fool, mouthed bitter jests. By now the Pope had ratified the appointment of Cranmer as Archbishop of Canterbury, and the veil of secrecy was wearing thin. Anne's brother was hurried off to France to smooth matters over there as much as possible, and enlist France's aid. But France was indignant over the way Henry had broken his promise to Francis not to innovate anything until another conference between the Pope and Francis had taken place, and George's too independent assurance made something of a breach. Meanwhile, Henry was carrying things at home with a high hand. The middle of March, a bill was introduced in Parliament settling the supreme authority in matrimonial cases on the primate and, in certain cases, on the convocation of the clergy. After three weeks' contest, the bill was carried by the houses which had been carefully packed by the royal ministers. In the meantime, convocation had been assembled, and by excusing certain of the clergy and requesting them to give their proxies to others, who could be depended upon to do the king's will, a heavy majority was obtained for the decision that the king's first marriage was invalid. Everything was now prepared for the lifting of the curtain, and yet, with all this forward, it was still with a curious sense of shock that the courtiers, hearing the trumpeters pealing one Saturday in April, and bearing their heads in expectation of the king, saw Anne Boleyn enter the hall with stately bearing, an assumption of haughty unconsciousness in her face, her purple velvet train, borne by the Countess of Richmond, Norfolk's daughter and wife of the king's illegitimate son. After her stepped her maids of honor, pale Helen Sackville and dark Amy Gainsford, Mary Wyatt, blushing from sheer pleasure, and Jane Seymour, demurely casting down her eyes. Anne walked slowly, with high-held head, the thrill of triumph coursing through her blood. This was her answer to cautioning friends and sneering enemies. She was queen at last. Norris, straightening from his bow, was visited with a sudden recollection. He nudged Brereton. Do you mind a day in this very hall when we saw Anne pass in the tale of the other's procession, stark mad over some news from Henry Percy? He whispered. Brereton shook his head, his eyes following Anne's royal progress down the great room with worshipping loyalty. By the mass, but you look as proud as she, Norris smiled. Good sooth I am, the big fellow admitted simply. I have had great heaviness of mind about her, but now methinks her troubles are all past. Thou faithful watchdog, Norris gave his friend's arm an affectionate squeeze. Nay, you need lose no more sleep over the fortunes of fair Anne Boleyn. Go to planning instead where to raise the ducats for your fine feathers for the coronation that's to be next month. End of chapter 23
Chapter 24 of The Favor of Kings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by May Hastings Bradley Chapter 24 Happiest of Women At Amphill, a fine rain was falling veiling the landscape like a curtain of grey from the eyes of the three women who were seated at the windows there were no signs of life to be seen from those windows nothing but the slowly widening puddles in the road and the rim of the woods looming indistinguishable and strange through the drizzling mist but the women had been seated there for hours in the inaction which had grown habitual with them through the years they did not talk much they were aware to the dreariest limits of ennui of the workings of each other's minds for so long they had lived at such close quarters mental and physical that no element of surprise or interest was left to them in each other they had at present a pretext for their presence at the windows they were awaiting the return of a page the nephew of lady wallop the youngest of the three women they had not much expectation of him until the next day or the next, for he would find London only too attractive after his inoccupation here, and it was with genuine surprise that they suddenly glimpsed his young figure on horseback galloping recklessly through the puddles. His advent was like a sudden stone in a motionless brook. They ringed him in circling confusion. "'The news, lad? What's been done?' old donna blanche clutched his shoulder with an eager hand is she crowned oh is she crowned hush her highness is sleeping another interposed wake her not be like this be too much for her ears let us have it first come boy what learned you is she crowned crowned she is gave back the page and at the consternation that fell upon them the sharp intake of breaths the rolling of eyes towards heaven he was visibly elated at the importance of his news. "'I reached the town as the lady was coming up the river to the tower,' he went on. "'And there were two hundred boats in her train, all splendidly hung and bedizened, and she had for a barge, what think you, none other than that of her own grace?' "'What, the queen's own barge? Oh, shame, shame! They say the king had given it to her, and the queen's arms were taken away and her own put on top. Her own? Lady Wallop fell to laughing. A fine invention, those arms, of a piece with the rest of the business. The popinjay, the donna's chin was trembling. Would none other suit her, but she must lay her foul Lutheran hands on that one? Did not the people cry out against it, lad? There were not so many that knew, it being so splendidly bedecked, the boy answered innocently but those that did know thought it great shame he assured her seeing her rage was somehow increased by his answer it was very wonderfully overhung with tissue of gold and of silver draped with shining clothes and made softly within by many cushions ay ay many cushions for that sweet body of hers may it burn in hell a thousand years and may mine eyes be given to feast upon that sight amen echoed another go on what else saw you of this most christian coronation why there were two hundred boats i am telling you madam from greenwich to the tower the river was a gleam of fine scarlet and purple and cloths of gold and silver flags flying and trumpets sounding and at the tower she was received with great booming of cannon there was feasting and revelry the whole night long, and all the next day while she lay at the tower. That day I did discharge me of thine errands, giving one letter to Chapuis, and another to the man, ye said, at the sign of the cat and the fiddle. And I made thy purchases. The city was busy making ready to receive the lady on the next day, and the householders were very angry at the expense, for a tax had been laid upon them all. Only the Spanish merchants had been excused from preparing some sort of entertainment, and the French envied them, saying that they were paying dear for their popularity with the lady. Well, on that day, which was Saturday, she entered the city in great procession, 
and there were fine preparations, flags and carpets hung from windows, and barriers erected to keep off the crowds. Everyone made holiday. A worthy cause. The Spanish woman's grim interjection checked the boy's enthusiasm. He had forgotten himself in the narration. Now as he went on he tried to infuse a becoming bitterness into his account. Yes, madam, and so muttered many people as she rode into the city. Nan Bullen is no queen of ours, they said. Natheless, they were all out in the streets to see her pass. The procession was headed by a dozen or so great French merchants who were residents of the city. It was whispered no knights would come over from France, for the purpose being uncertain yet politically. But the merchants made a marvellous fine showing, all in purple velvet, with the lady's device on their sleeves. A fine jest, that device, Lady Wallop broke in, for she chose one at random that was the motto of her bitter foes. Ainsi sera, grogne qui grogne. Nay, aunt, she hath chosen another, the boy corrected. I know not how long ago, but tis all over London now. Happiest of women, it is. La plus heureuse, as she writ it in French. The gentlemen all bore it in some fashion. After the merchants rode English noblemen and gentlemen, according to their degree, and then the Lord Chancellor with the Venetian ambassador, and then the primate with Bailey de Troyes. And after these came the ladies' litter, carried by two white mules, and draped most lavish with white satin. There was a canopy of cloth of gold borne over her head, and at one side rode the Duke of Suffolk, and at the other Sir William Howard, in the stead of his brother, the Duke of Norfolk, who hath been sent to France. The lady herself, and in spite of himself the boy's eyes glistened with the remembered sight, sat in this open litter, bowing and smiling on every one. She struck the eye in a blaze of white and scarlet. White and gold I wore, came a measured voice behind them. Catherine stood in the doorway. Her face was set in the stiff, unrevealing lines with which she tried to fortify it against the curious, but her eyes betrayed the consuming fire of the spirit within. "'Continue, boy,' she commanded dryly, the discomfited page. "'Continue. How say you was attired this happiest of women?' "'In a surcoat of white tissue, so please your grace,' the boy stammered with an ermine edge and crimson velvet beneath set stiff with gems she made a vain show of her hair letting it fall over her like a mantle she to be married in her hair like a maid said catherine and on her brow she wore a coronet of diamonds with other diamonds about her throat and on her breast a jewel of monstrous size of red stones of particular beauty i she scarcely missed my poor remainders then strange that the king should even have sent unto me proceed master wallop why why after that one came many ladies in cloth of gold and velvet riding on hackneys and in a chariot rode the old dowager duchess of norfolk and the mother of the lady and from the tower they took their way by fenchurch and grace church to leadenhall and on by cheapside ludgate fleet street and the strand to whitehall you speak, I think, of York Place? Catherine never could bear to hear the name which Anne and Henry had rechristened the Cardinal's Palace. She had hated Wolsey as keenly as had ever Anne, but in this she took sides with him. Yes, Your Grace, York Place. A fine procession, truly. But one that gave the people small joy, the page eagerly assured the fallen queen. Although many huzzahed and cheered, there were some who did not, and among the women not a few murmured and cried out, Nan Bullen, and shame, shame, some even so loudly that it must have reached her ears, though her smiles ceased not. Cry out? Why do they not turn on the vile creature, said Lady Wallop fiercely, and drag her from her litter and her abominable finery, and tear those diamonds from her hair? Oh, if I had her... I would mark her well with these ten fingers, and Catherine's partisan crooked a suggestive claw, so that King Henry would never leave another kiss there. The double-fingered scum, the unclean Lutheran, the shame of all Christendom. They did what they dared, the page urged. 
They plagued her in what ways they could. Many back in the crowd uncapped not, and her fool saw it and cried out they must have scurvy heads. At Grace Church Corner, where the merchants of the steel yard had been obliged by the Lord Mayor to erect a fine pageant, they did revenge themselves for the expense they had been put to. The pageant was fine in a but an image of Mount Parnassus on top of which sat Apollo, with the muses, and the fountain ran with Rhenish wines to the great pleasure of all who were allowed to drink of it. And when the lady's litter halted before it, all the muses sang verses in her praise. But as the lady smiled and read the epigrams in her honor with which the mount was decked, on a sudden her brow grew black, and she bade her escort be on, she had marked the imperial eagle with the emblems of your grace's house, at the summit of the mount and down obscure. At the very bottom were wrought the arms her father pretends to, no doubt but that she smoked thereat. But there is naught they say she can do to those German merchants, for it is of a truth that the arms of the emperor are higher than those of Wiltshire. Ay, is it so? quoth Catherine, with heavy sarcasm. The lad looked bewildered. He had a talent for direct narrative, but the subtleties of things escaped him with the idea that he had somehow offended. He offered propitiatingly. They may deck her way with cloth of gold, they cannot with English smiles, I heard said. By some woman? I. Continue, I pray you. What else was there to this goodly entertainment? It was all much alike. At diverse corners came out children dressed as angels, singing songs and reciting verses in the lady's praise to puff up further her vain spirit. The trick of speech the lad had caught from these women went quaintly with his eager face, naively thrilled by these wonders he affected to disdain. But as I said, madam, some did what they could to thwart her. At Leadenhall the merchants of the staple at another pageant, and on it sat St. Anne and Mary Cleophas, with four children, one of whom stepped forward and delivered a long oration, in which she said, and the boy began to grin knowingly, that as from St. Anne had sprung a fruitful tree, so might that be true of this Anne. And as the good St. Anne never had but the one child, a daughter, our holy virgin, why, the wish was not to the lady's liking. It must have gone hard to smile on that child. From Leadenhall and Cornfield she went, and at the cross at Cheapside waited the Lord Mayor and his men, to do her honor. And the master baker rode forward with a speech and handed her a purse. A thousand marks in gold therein. I know that custom. And therein she showed herself a mean creature of low degree, cried the boy, for it was noted that she kept the purse and the crowd murmured, and told how the good Queen Catherine had given hers to the captain of the guard to divide among the halberdiers and lackeys. "'I could not read the future then,' said Catherine, a wry smile twisting her mouth. "'I could not see how I should now lack for gold to clothe me and my poor faithful servants. I thought all my troubles past. God knows there had been plenty of them.' How long ago it is, twenty-four years, since I went that road that she is traveling today. But it will not be so long ere she follows in my steps, follows dishonored and uncrowned. I know the man. I was, I am, his wife, and what he hath is like a millstone about his neck until he can cast it off. He was ever changing. Go on, boy. Why are you stopped? Was I speaking loud? Go on. I saw little else, madam. At Westminster, it was said the king met the lady on the threshold and said, Well? How like you this, sweetheart? faltered the boy. And I had it that she tossed her head and made answer, I saw many uncapped, by the way. Tis said she takes all that he does as no more than her due. This morning the lady came on foot into the abbey to her coronation, followed by all that throng most splendidly attired. I pressed as close as I could, but t'was so jammed I could only hang hither and yon upon its skirts. Those in front whispered what was doing. They said it was a grand sight. The boy's tone was unconsciously wistful. The ceremonies were very fine. I remember them, the queen informed him. A pity you saw them not. 
but you may live to see another if matters go on so merrily in england and so they crowned her crowned her she is queen at last queen anne queen all the imprisoned anger the heartache and the hatred of those seven long years blazed suddenly on catherine's voice and transfigured her heavy face with passion so she is queen of england she said and you she flung a shaking hand at her attendants you are all to remember that i am no more than the princess of wales widow of a boy these thirty-one years deceased and all that hath been since all these ceremonies of marriage and of wifehood my coronation and my reign are no more than phantoms of a dream that are to be forgotten i must be styled no longer queen so say those pious ministers who came unto us last month but rather princess a learned court oh heaven have you no bolt to fly at them has sat in solemn judgment on my good name and cranmer hath pronounced that i was never a wife oh it is an infamy too vile for credence ten years agone i would have smiled at such a fantasy yet it is not to me it is not whate'er they do is not they are not my judges there is none can judge save him the pope in whom i trust but oh why is he dumb so long why hath he not succoured me in my distress i have waited i have waited will nothing stir him but though all desert me i will never yield she stopped suddenly her mouth working then turned abruptly and walked back to her chamber drawing shut the door in a life of many bitter moments there had been none bitterer than this anne was crowned queen long ago catherine had yielded to that younger woman place and power and had become a shadow queen fighting desperately for her crowned rights and dignities now after the long anguish and struggle they had accomplished their purpose and taken even the crown away from her to place on that younger fairer head how clearly she could see that crowning catherine sank heavily to her knees on the steps of the altar in her room holding up her clasped hands as if to ward off this blow that was come upon her she tried to move her lips in prayer but she knew not what she was saying between her and the crucifix there swam a vision of that head bending with such delicate grace to receive that crown which had been hers she could see the glint of diamonds on that slender neck the flash of the sumptuous silks could hear them rustle as anne rose and turning faced the crowded abbey with such radiant smiling eyes as queen queen a dreadful pain was stabbing at the older woman's heart she felt choking suffocating she fought for breath torturing herself with that one word queen all that her insolent rival had boasted had come to pass it was unbelievable it was unthinkable for years Catherine had schooled herself not to think it, had refused to face such a possibility, insisting passionately that Christendom would not tolerate such a mockery, that the Pope would rebuke this defiance and reinstate his dutiful daughter. But now it seemed that Christendom was blind and deaf, and the Pope's promises were less than vapor. Poor deluded fool that she had been, to think that right and justice counted for aught in this world against self-interest. She had lost. Lost. Her very brain refusing dully to accept the meaning of this thing which had come upon her. It was as if she were sinking under assassins' knives, while refusing to believe the fact of the assassination. Tomorrow she might goad up her spirit. Tomorrow she might fight afresh but now she was stricken and prostrate. Anne was queen. And to her crucifix she whispered chokingly, Happiest of women. End of chapter 24。Chapter 25 of The Favor of Kings。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by May Hastings Bradley Chapter 25 The Child To Anne it seemed at last that her goal had been won and all dangers past, 
and such annoyances as the people's opposition could prick her with were but a feather's weight against the measure of her joyousness. The happiest of women moved through the days of her coronation as through a dream, elate and radiant, smiling at the world with gay, proud eyes. After the coronation there had been a great banquet in Westminster Hall with the new queen in solemn state. The haughtiest ladies of the land sat at her feet beneath the table to do her more honor, and the highest peers of England acted as butlers and servants. Dish after dish was brought to her on golden platters, served by earls and dukes on horseback, and after each had served his dish he spurred his horse about the hall beneath the admiring throngs in the gallery, while the building echoed with cheers for the new majesty. The title on the lips that accosted her was balm to the young queen. Your Majesty. Your Highness. How she thrilled to the sound of them. Even in the irony of Carew's inflection, she found a sweetness that made her smile his bitterness away. The knave had loved her so long, and she was so utterly out of his reach. That, too, accounted for the sadness of Wyatt's smiles as she pressed his hand with a triumphant, What said I, cousin? There had reached her, on the morning of her coronation, a cluster of white roses still fresh with dew, and in their midst she had found these verses. Forget not yet the tried intent of such a truth as I have meant. My great travail so gladly spent, forget not yet. Forget not yet when first began the weary life you know, since when the suit, the service, none can tell, forget not yet. Forget not yet the great essays, the cruel wrong, the scornful ways, the painful patience in delays, forget not yet. Forget not, oh, forget not this, how long ago hath been, and is, the love that never meant amiss, forget not yet. Forget not then thine own approved, the which so constant hath thee loved, whose steadfast faith yet never moved, forget not this. "'Tis hard that one person's joy should be another's woe,' mused Anne, as she thrust the verses under very careful lock and key. But her fleet pang of sympathy was soon smothered in the ecstasy of those enchanted days. But the magic change that Anne expected the coronation to make in her position did not take place. She was queen, and yet things appeared much the same as before. Her pinnacle had been gained, but it was a slippery pinnacle and there was the same alert holding on to be done. The country people did not swallow the fact of her queenship as readily as did the immediate court. They were less influenced by political policies, by niceties of jurisdiction. They knew only that Catherine had been queen for over twenty years, and that now in old age she was in retirement while another wore the crown. And when Catherine was removed from Amphill to Bugden, the peasants crowded round her, cheering and crying that they would have no queen but her. Anne was piqued that Henry passed this over without punishment, and she found the behavior of the Easterlings, the Hanseatic merchants, her old enemies, more odious still, for they anchored their fleet directly opposite Greenwich Palace and invited Chapuy, the Spanish ambassador on board, and under pretext of his honor they hoisted the imperial eagle, fired cannon, feasted, and made a tremendous demonstration. "'Punish them,' urged Anne angrily. "'It can't be done,' Cromwell had pacifically pointed out. More and more, through Anne's favor, that unresting Cromwell had gathered the reins of state into his able hands. The fleet is strongly manned, and as the steelyard is still armed, the Germans may prove stronger than the king. Take no notice, your highness. Demonstrations soon wear away.' And so Anne moved from Greenwich to Windsor out of reach of their annoyances. The marriage and coronation had brought its chain of political difficulties with it. King Francis, however, secretly pleased he might be at the marriage, wished Henry to go on defending his cause at Rome, during which endless time Henry would have had to rely more and more on support from Francis, and would really have sunk to the level of a client of France. When England took things into her own hands, and the sentence of divorce was pronounced by the archbishopical court, Francis was angry, and the French party, even at the English court, 
felt that Anne's faction had behaved most cavalierly and grew hostile to the new queen. The Pope was furious. He proceeded very promptly against Henry and cited him in the person of his ambassador to appear to the Rota. Henry retaliated by appealing to the next free council an act strictly forbidden by the rules of the church. Such vigor on Henry's part was possible through the absence of Norfolk, on the personally ungrateful errand of defending his king's interests with the French, an errand which Norfolk rightly suspected had been presented him through Anne's and Cromwell's desire to get him out of the country and check his influence. The Pope was very naturally inflamed at this defiance, and there was no need to urge him to proceed now. He made as great haste as possible. Eager to stir up enemies against Henry, he was ready to promise Calais to Francis to induce him to take the field against England with the Emperor, and he urged the advisability of the Princess Mary's being married to the Earl of Surrey, the son of the Duke of Norfolk, thus to alienate that party from Anne and overthrow Henry. To be sure, the Earl of Surrey had a wife living, but the Pope was ready enough to pronounce annulment in that case. But as the Pope's advisers were uncertain as to the success of these plans, he proceeded to do what lay in his immediate power, declared the proceedings of Cranmer null and void, commanded Cranmer, Henry, and Anne to undo all that had been done in the last six weeks, and took an affirmative vote from the cardinals declaring that the Pope really had the right to dispense for a marriage with a deceased brother's widow. Back and forth hurried messengers to Henry from Francis, to Francis from Henry. Anne's brother and Brian, her cousin, were constantly in the saddle. When Francis' aid appeared lost, Cromwell struck out an independent policy for England and sent messengers to Germany and to the Dukes of Bavaria, who were hostile to the imperial power, to try to arrange for aid for England there. Of all these comings and goings, these plots and counterplots, the woman who was their cause was in ignorance. She rested at Greenwich, now that the Easterlings had sailed away, and as the hope of the English succession was with her, all that could possibly be of disturbance to her was avoided. And though she surmised the uneasiness of the political situation, she did not divine its extreme agitation, and she was not alarmed. She had foreseen a fuss, as she had merrily phrased it, but she was assured that it would all blow over once there was an heir in England. She did not dare let herself consider the possibility of the child being a girl. She concealed, even from herself, a fear of that consequence. She knew that Henry refused to contemplate such a disappointment for even a moment. Every soothsayer, every fortune-teller, and he consulted many, assured him, of the success of his hopes. The very stars predicted the birth of his prince, they declared, and his natural optimism was fed to certainty. It must be a boy, it must, Anne used to whisper passionately to herself, as the slow damp days of that summer crept by in uncongenial inactivity for her alert spirit. Unconsciously she had come to feel, though she would not admit it openly to herself, how her hold on Henry depended more and more on her hope of a boy instead of her personal attractions. Those attractions had waned, to be sure, as that hope had gained. She was pale, listless, hollow-eyed, but she was to be the mother of England's future king. There lay her strength for all time, and as the crisis neared, her excitement tightened to tension. She could not ride out, and she watched wistfully from her windows the parties that set out daily. She seemed so little to be missed. There was always some woman at the king's side now. At first Anne smiled, thinking his attentions no more than the restless activities of his insatiable vanity. But her pride was touched. And one day, Henry, entering her presence for the first time in three days, found an angry-eyed woman, bitterly indignant. She had suffered in those days a new intolerable resentment. She had been neglected. She had been jealous. All the court knew that Henry had been with other women, drinking and carousing. To Anne, it had been lightning from a clear sky. Her vanity, the vanity of a beautiful and supremely successful woman, was pierced to the quick. Her pride was intolerably outraged. She, Anne Boleyn, 
Queen Anne, neglected. To be sure, there had been the rumors during the long period of her engagement of sundry sly carousals on Henry's part, but the girl had ignored them all as random and unworthy excursions of all that was unworthiest in him, and the women who were the heroines of these adventures were unknown, uncared for creatures, mere accidents of the moment, unaware themselves of the identity of their companion. But this was different. These were court women, peeresses of the realm, and he was her husband. He had vowed her an absolute fidelity. Everything that was wife in her suffered. She flashed her anger and resentment at him with the vehement sincerity that always characterized her outbreaks. Did you think I would not hear? she demanded. The king scowled at his boots and for an instant made no answer. Then he muttered without looking at her, I care not what ye hear. Anne caught her breath. This, to her. You care not? she echoed, her voice rising on an incredulous note. Henry shrugged. You do not care, she repeated, her breath quickening, that I know that you have been untrue to the vows you have made me, that I know how you have deceived me ere I have been a wife a year, how you have been false to yourself and to me when things are as they are. Her voice broke, but again he made no answer, only pursing his lips and staring past her with irritating indifference. And as she saw his face, it seemed to her the face of a stranger. How full his lips were, how sunken his small eyes in his flesh. She had known he was growing stouter through the years, but she had not stopped and observed that stoutness. She had merely added it unconsciously to the image she possessed of Henry. Now she saw that the change had shattered that image. He was not the lover she had known. His youth, his strength, his charm had all been crushed by that bulk of flesh which had descended upon him so smotheringly. He seemed to her enormous, unwholesome. The spirit seemed to have wasted and died inside that great body of his, and only the body remained with its desires and appetites. She felt a terrific antagonism possess her to this insentient mass of flesh. And Henry, glancing sidewise at her, after a pause from under his drooping lids, observed with dissatisfaction how unlovely and pale she was and how ill her anger became her. And his spite flickered up under his sullenness that she dared to rail at him and to oppose her claim on him to the gratification of his pleasures. "'You'd best say no more,' he muttered. "'Say no more?' She mocked his words contemptuously. Do you think I am going to submit to this in silence? Do you think I will endure it? He gave her a look of malice. Your betters have done so. My betters, was all Anne could say for a moment. She was terribly angry. Such a taunt from Henry. Her betters. And you call yourself my husband, she said indistinctly. I, so I call myself. His emphasis was vindictive. But not so do many, and I bid you remember that if I have raised you, it is in my power to lower you as quickly as I have raised you. That was thunder after lightning. Anne struggled to her feet. Try it. She flung at him. Make yourself the mock of England with your wiving and unwiving. How can you lower me? I am your wedded wife, your crowned queen. What you have done you cannot undo. Be not so sure, came from him sullenly. He was no match for her in declamation, but his retorts were terrifying in their menace. Anne felt her strength deserting her. She was ill and weak and at the terrible disadvantage of her ill health and unloveliness. She was afraid of what she would do next. There was a lump in her throat. The tears were just inside her eyelids. She would have despised herself for breaking down, but she feared she was on the verge and summoning her strength, she pushed past her husband and shut the door of her room most ungently between them. And when next day at Mass she and Henry met, she gave no sign of recognition, and he, after the first surprised stare, followed her example. For three days there was no communication between them, but at that game Anne held the cards. She was to be mother of England's prince, and she must not be alarmed. When Henry's temper subsided, he must conciliate her for the sake of their child. 
If she thought of the difference of that victory from one gained personally, she did not let her mind dwell upon its significance. And so on the fourth day, when a fine basket of fruit came from the king, she sent back a civil message of thanks, and when Henry was shortly afterwards announced, she greeted him as if nothing had happened, almost as if nothing had happened. There was a little frost in her manner that did not thaw until he crossed the room to where she lay on the couch and stooped to pass his hand caressingly over her hair. Her hair, at least, was unchanged in its loveliness. Come, Anne, he said coaxingly. She caught at the stroking hand, and the next moment he bent over her. For one instant, as he kissed her, she had a renewed perception of the thickness and grossness of those lips. The next it was swept away before her old-time tenderness for him. In the need of his comfort, she clung pathetically to him, and the tears her weakness could not prevent slipped out from under her lids. Come in, he rebuked, gently kissing them away. Thou must not so excite thyself. Twas thou excited me, she returned. Thou wast so, so bitter hard. To think that thou, thou must not provoke me in. And then Henry slid away from the dangerous topic. Come, a mere trifle. Tis all over now, and all as it was before. Her eyes were wistful as they searched his. Is all as it was before? Harry? Why, in verity, it is. Now try to sleep. Thou art not going to stay? Oh, dost thou need me? I have a conference. Go to that conference. And she gave him a smile. And thank thee for the fruit. It was very sweet. End of chapter 25《Chapter Twenty Six of the Favor of Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by May Hastings Bradley. Chapter Twenty Six A Rival Flouted. There was no doubt that the little Princess Elizabeth, however flagrant her offense in being a princess, was as engaging a bit of royalty as could be imagined, a fat, chubby, cuddly creature, all dimples and adorable creases. She had the Tudor coloring, fair-skinned, blue-eyed, with curls that were Henry's own yellow, reddened to chestnut, and she had the Tudor willfulness that she maintained with a strength of lung penetrating far beyond the royal apartments. What a little prince she would have made! How that prince would have won the people! The very image of Henry at her age, so the old wives who had attended the king's infancy declared, and they recounted doting tales of Henry's young charms to which Anne gave an inattentive wonder that any one so gross and vulgar could ever have been a dear miracle of a baby. She could not picture Henry rosy and sweet, sucking his thumb. She could not picture him again as she had first known him. All that was young and frank in him seemed done to death in that mountain of flesh. Anne's feeling for her child was the most intense that had ever come into her stormy life. It was a passion utterly unforeseen and uncontemplated. In her dreams of the child to be, the child had meant nothing except to her ambition. He was the prince who was to hush the last murmur against her, to cement forever the bond between herself and the king. He was to be her unassailable defense. None of this had come to pass. She had been cruelly disappointed. The girl had brought confusion and distress upon her. She was something to protect and not to give protection. Yet Anne's love went out to her in redoubled tenderness, and her anger against their opponents burned with a hotter flame. She thought of the Princess Mary with tightening lips and hardening heart as the menace of her child the enemy of this helpless, clinging little thing that nestled against her heart. If there were to be no princes, and for all Anne's spoken assurance she drew that secret fear from Henry's diseased and corrupted frame, it must be Elizabeth, not Mary, who should sit upon England's throne. If Elizabeth were left in Mary's care, when that thought stung her, Anne strained her baby spasmodically to her breast, and her heart beat in anguished dread. Her fierce wish could have struck both Catherine and Mary dead at her feet. 
Mary was seventeen now, and beginning to be reckoned with. She had been filled by her mother with a defiant hatred of the supplanter, and referred to Anne always by the vilest of names. If Mary had submitted to the divorce, Henry would have granted her right as a legitimate heiress. But now, angered at her determined opposition, and incessant appeals to the Spanish minister and to Rome, he had determined to deprive her. So perhaps it was as well that she had been so defiant, thought Anne. But she must submit now, she must realize how hopeless her contentions were, for they were hopeless as long as Anne could hold the king, and this holding of the king was the thought that filled the young queen's mind as she lay in the state bed at Windsor through the grey September days one arm cuddling the tiny bundle at her side. She faced facts with hard, disillusioned eyes. Henry had had a tremendous passion for her, that had been inflamed by denial. His vanity, his desire, and his obstinacy had all been enlisted in that momentous struggle which had resulted in her coronation. That passion was satisfied. She had brought chagrin and disappointment and vexation to him. Her body was no mystery now to yield its secret. She had given him her all. Already his caprices had veered in a dozen different directions, and she saw that it was her part now to recreate in him the illusion of her mystery and his desire. She must bewitch afresh, re-enchant, re-enthrall. Stripped of all zest and romance, she must play the game again from the very beginning, and against new and alarming odds. Reigning as queen was not the easy thing her dazzled eyes had pictured. And yet she was queen, she sharply reminded herself. For seven years she had fought the fight to that throne. She would fight now from it to the last. She must make sure of Henry. The foreign tangle, bad as it was, held no such menace for her as the king's flirtations. Just now, the whisper reached her before Elizabeth was a week old, there was a certain blonde in favor, a cousin of Sir Nicholas Carew, before whom the court was fawning. And so while ministers were planning messages and counter-messages, plots and counter-plots, Anne on her sick-bed planned a gown, a rich, flowing, shimmering, crimson robe like a flame. And like a flame she descended in it one fet night into the midst of a surprised and slightly startled court accustomed to the absence of its ailing queen. For except for her tottering presence at the child's christening when five days old, Anne had kept her chambers. There was no sign of illness about her now. Her body had gathered strength from her spirit, and she bore herself triumphantly, feeling that she was again the self of old, before her motherhood had claimed her, erect, alert, confident, unconquerable. The evening was half over before she saw the thing that she had come to see. The company, broken into small groups, had fallen from its perfunctory addresses into intimate chat. The Duke of Norfolk stood trifling with one of the Queen's household, Elizabeth Holland, and as Anne's eyes roamed past them she saw Suffolk pass through a draped doorway with another of her maids, while his young wife stood watching from across the room. He was typical of the times, that Suffolk, thought Anne with curling lips. Henry's sister had not been in her grave ten weeks before Suffolk had married again, and married the betrothed of his son, and now here he was already neglecting her for another. The next moment Anne saw Suffolk's son approach the girl who had been his sweetheart, and was now his stepmother, and with half-guilty looks about, the two shrank closer into the shadow of the overhanging gallery. But it was not this play, this tragic farce, that Anne had interest in. Her eyes slipped past these groups, past a knot of the king's gentlemen, Norris and Barreton and Weston and George, egging on two jesters, Patch and Somers, to a trial of wits to where the king himself stood at the far end of the hall. He was talking rapidly with a confidential air. The woman who listened to him, now smiling up at him, now sighing down into her fan, was the cousin of Sir Nicholas Carew. Anne turned to where a short, heavy man lounged, slightly apart from the others, watching the kaleidoscopic scene with inscrutable sharp eyes, and made a quick gesture. The man who was Thomas Cromwell, the all-important secretary, 
hurried to her side with that awkward, uneven gait which matched his cumbersome frame. "'Your arm, sir,' the Queen spoke with unconscious sharpness born of a gathering distrust. She had heard how, when Elizabeth was but a few days old, Cromwell had ridden out to fly his hawks and met certainly, by appointment, Chepuy, the Spanish ambassador, and how the two had long talked. It was certain that the secretary was considering changing his allegiance. Now the hope of a prince had failed. Well, he should see if her star was on the wane. She pressed the tips of her fingers on his arm, and as she directed their steps to the oblivious king, he gave her a sudden look of inquiry, but said nothing. "'Ah, good even. I have not seen you before, Mistress Carew.' Anne's voice, with its bell-like quality of sweetness and clearness, cut unexpectedly into the tete-a-tete. The instinct which made Henry dissemble in any confusion caused him to turn to Anne with a smile on his lips, and she gave him a most vivid one in return, a saucy, swift, little smile that heralded mischief. And then her look, bright and glittering as steel, played over the woman before her, scathing, while it registered the charms she presented. The woman was plump and very fair. The delicate pallor of her skin was whitened by a powder to a degree that contrasted strikingly with the scarlet of her lips. They were as red as Anne's gown. Her light blue eyes held a look of satirical suspicion as she smilingly replied, "'I have already had the pleasure of making my compliments to your grace this night. So I did not recollect thee. Perhaps, came the malicious suggestion, your grace's memory is not yet fully recovered. I trust you are feeling well? Vastly well, mistress, vastly well. I would I could think the same of you, but your pallor prevents me. Are you not faint? Nay, your grace. Tut! You are bravely feigning health. Why, you are as white as a chalk. You should have a dash of cold water to restore your natural complexion. Thy face is too sickly for thy word's credit. Why, thou art fairly green. Is she not, my lord? Anne put unexpectedly to Henry in a tone of insistent solicitude, and Henry, taken unawares, could only gaze at the angry woman at whom his wife was pointing her fan. I fear thou hast too much exerted thyself, went on Anne's mocking tones, edged with indescribable irony. Master Secretary, give you your arm to escort this lady to the fresh air. She hath need of it, she commanded. And as her speechless rival took her and forced departure with the silent secretary, Anne turned swiftly to Henry to forestall any intention he might have of accompanying them. She shook her fan coquettishly at him. Ah, fie, fie on thee, Harry. Tell me not that this is the very she that rumor hath been linking to thy name. I protest my vanity thought better of thy royal taste. Her blithe audacity held Henry dumb, staring at her uncertainly as she flashed on. La, sir, do you call that fair? Where are thy eyes? Tis a china mug. When it grins, twill crack. The colors are laid on so thick. La, how she glowered when I said water to her. Anne's laugh rang out infectiously. That smile she knew was her captured pennant and the wine of victory ran through her. Why, sir, she laughed, still shaking her fan at her husband, if thou must leave me, let it be for nothing that will do such discredit to the royal standards. Remember thou art a lesson to this court. Where else should taste be upheld save in the king? Try that tall brunette over there. She hath at least some hair of her own. I vow I could summon a qualm or so about her, but as for this lady china mug, I could not squeeze out a proper wifely tear. Again Anne laughed when Henry joined her in a sudden shout and leaned forward and pinched her arm in one of his veering reversals of humor. By the rood, and thou lookest like that, thou wilt never have cause for tears, he vowed. I believe thee, Anne tossed her head airily, and the diamonds glistened like falling spray. My mirror told me as much before thee, but did not tell thee as will I, he breathed into her ear. Ah, how easy, her confident vanity gaily reassured her, how easy it all was for her, after all. And how easy it was later, when they were alone in her chamber, 
to fully complete that victory and bind him to her with those charms she knew so well how to exert. Kisses, flattery, love words, adoration unstinted. She knew the way very well. She had only to force her reluctant arms into a tender clasp, only to play traitor to that terrible shrinking in herself from what he called his love, only to betray her cold lips and unwilling flesh, never again for her now the old veil of romance and tender illusion. Life was mercilessly clear. Never again those maiden-misted dreams. But this was the price. She paid it for her crown, for the redemption of her pride, and the exultation of her spirit. She paid for her daughter's heritage. Many women paid it for less. So she told herself, when the king slept and she lay wide-eyed at his side, staring into the darkness. In the morning the decree went forth that Mary Tudor must no longer be known as Princess, but as Lady Mary. Elizabeth was the only princess in England. As soon as might be, Henry proposed to have Parliament ratify this and pass a definite act of succession. When Elizabeth was three months old, it was considered high time for her to have an establishment of her own, according to all royal precedent. Anne had dreaded this time, and she would have opposed it but for fear of lessening Elizabeth's position as a princess by leaving unfulfilled any of her prerogatives. So the mother stifled the cravings of her reawakened heart, and the three months baby went to Hatfield in charge of Mrs. Shelton. Anne's aunt, accompanied by a long and stately retinue, and to Hatfield also went Lady Mary to be attached to her tiny sister's establishment. It seemed to Anne and Henry that if Mary were in constant daily association with Elizabeth and the evidences of her position that she would understand the baselessness of her own hopes and accept her assigned role. And it was in the back of Anne's mind that Mary might perhaps succumb to the little sister's attraction. It seemed to her impossible that any one should long withstand her and enroll themselves against her. But if Mary continued obdurate, she was in reliable hands at Hatfield, and any attempt to escape to the continent and there gather a hostile force with which to invade England, rumors of this constantly circulated about the court, could be more easily frustrated. Mary, indeed, continued obdurate. She made that journey to Hatfield by force. She had to be shoved into her litter by the Duke of Norfolk, and the feat of handling a kicking seventeen-year-old girl roundly taxed the small Duke's physical prowess. I'd have wrung her neck for a mirren, he reported viciously to his niece. I'd do it for love, Anne retorted. Lord, each day brings its rumor about her. Now she is to be smuggled out of the country and head an opposing army. Now she is dying by poison or torture and at my hands. Chapuy is most eager to make her the cause of war. He is constantly writing the emperor those inflaming accounts, stirring him up, shaking all the red rags of lies at him he can manufacture. I learned today of a dispatch of his that proclaims his great fear for Catherine's life and retails her straits at Kimbolton. She is in no straits at all. The place is not immense, but it is pleasant enough, and if she have not all the money in the world, that is her own fault. Parliament stands ready to pay it to her as Princess Dowager, but she will have all or nothing. The mention of Catherine always brought an edge of rancor to Anne's tone. She remained silent now, staring out with hard eyes. Then she drew an unconscious sigh of great weariness. Would she were gone, she said. Till then I have no peace of mind. This secret anxiety that lurked in Anne's heart, ceaselessly gnawing with fine, sharp teeth, was brought again into light by an episode in February. Mary had been particularly troublesome of late. It was found that plans for her escape were all laid and only frustrated by the vigilance of Cromwell's agents. The indefatigable secretary had long been laying the foundation of that spy system, that was to terrorize his enemies, and if Mary once escaped to the continent, she could be used by all England's enemies as a rallying cry. Charles might demand England in her name. 
She might be wedded to some prince who would essay to establish her claims for his benefit. There was no limit, in fact, to the things which the imagination of English statesmen saw might be done with Mary. Irascible at his messenger's failures with her, Henry himself set suddenly out for Hatfield one day, resolving to try the persuasion of his personal influence. When Anne learned of his departure, she went white. It was a thing she had feared, this meeting of father and daughter. She knew how Mary had often tried to bring this to pass. Henry had been fond of her, he had used to make an excessive show of it, and while this fondness had not prevented his venting his spite upon her, while it was entirely inoperative in separation, once they met, once Mary wept and made a show of submission to touch the facile sentiment in him that moved so lightly upon the surface, a gusty tide swayed back and forth by an erratic moon. There was no knowing to what length of reconciliation Henry would go. The pair would weep, kiss, clasp. Anne's fear could see it all. Ride, she shot at Norris and Weston, the two inseparables who had brought her the news of the king's departure. Ride like the wind and overtake his majesty. Do you so that on no account he sees the print, uh, the Lady Mary. Norris cocked the quizzical eyes of intimacy at her. Now how shall we put that to him? Why, as you can best devise for the moment, say aught you like, say, and bit her lip, say that I, hearing of his purpose, fell into such low and desperate spirits that you wrote at once to acquaint him and dissuade him from the project. Beseech him to look only upon the Princess Elizabeth. Say that I beseech him and ye like. If that works not, say that I command. Her sense of urgency spoke in her face and voice and the very arrogance of her imperativeness, and until the return of the party she paced about her rooms in restless and uneasy apprehension. She was more than ever convinced of her foresight in sending that message when she heard from Norris the full account of the king's visit. True to the request which overtook him, he made no effort to see Mary, but as he was leaving, after viewing the infant Elizabeth, who most regrettably was suffering from colic and screamed the air blue. His eldest daughter appeared on the terrace above him, kneeling, as if to ask his blessing. He had waved his hand to her, and it had seemed as if he were on the point of returning, but checked himself and rode off. It was noticed that there were tears in his eyes, and that evening he spoke to the French ambassador about his daughter with affectionate praise. For her obedience... Anne queried scornfully. Her accomplishments, Norris smiled. Aye, her accomplishments? I had not heard of these before, Anne sniffed. But her conscience pinched her as she jeered. Something of her natural sense of fairness, yet uncorrupted by her hatred, whispered to her that Mary was behaving exactly as she herself would behave in her place. Would she ever own any other woman her mother's successor? Would she own any child of that union of her own supplanter? Anne tried to tell herself that under the circumstances she would have the sense to do so and not ceaselessly provoke an inevitable opposition, but that secret whisper in her was not hushed. Her vivid imagination flashed across her mind a sudden picture of the life that the seventeen-year-old girl was leading, apart from her mother, attached to the household of her rival sister possessed with bitterness and rebellion. So stirred by sudden kindly resolve, the flowering of that seed of mother love in her heart, Anne rode out to Hatfield, some weeks later, to effect a reconciliation. Tell the Lady Mary, she said to Jane Seymour, who had accompanied her, tell her that if she will but be friendly and kind, I will be friendly and kind to her, and work things better for her at court and with her father. I would be glad to see her, tell her. Then Anne hurried to the chamber of her little daughter, and drawing off her riding gauntlets, gathered the sleeping child hungrily in her arms. What change there was, she thought, observing almost jealously the progress of the weeks with that young life. How Elizabeth's hair had grown. She passed her hand over the ringlets and then buried her face in the soft creases of the little neck, all warm and damp from sleep, with the hungry passion of her starved maternity. 
Elizabeth woke lazily, unclosing big blue eyes like bits of sky, and adorably smiled. Jane Seymour appeared at the door. Well? questioned the queen. The girl hesitated, and gave her mistress a soft glance as if to beseech her not to connect the unwelcome mouthpiece in any way with the message. Then she cast down her eyes. Jane had a quiverful of these mild tricks that she spread about her, adorning her somewhat uninspiring speech. In a soft voice she repeated, The Lady Mary bade me say that she would be most grateful if the king's mistress did aught to soften the king's heart to her. Anne bent lower over her baby. She felt the hot blood rush to her cheeks, betraying her helpless anger. Go back and tell her that the Queen of England is minded to be a friend to her, and she show herself one. Now has she the mending of her circumstances in her hands. In a few moments Jane again presented herself. The Lady Mary replied that she knew of no Queen in England but the good Queen Catherine, her mother, who was indeed a good friend to her. If the King's mistress had any good will to her, she could show the same by stripping herself of her pretensions repeated Jane in her pretty, precise tones, with a manner that conveyed more than ever her sense of extreme grief and shock at being in any way associated with this repugnant sentiments. Yet Anne found the girl's masked gaze distasteful. A dangerous flame burned in her cheeks. She gave an angry laugh. She said, Well, thus endeth our endeavor. We have other ways of dealing with her than by beseechment. She can look to herself now, I'll down that Spanish blood. And she shows her teeth so to you, Anne turned sharply to her aunt. Look you, you can box her ears and you list. I'll have no more favors shown her. The next month Parliament passed the Act of Succession, which settled the inheritance to the crown upon the children of Anne, and which contained a clause that enacted that all adult subjects should be sworn to observe this act and the same month came the sentence from the consistory of cardinals at Rome, given after a long and fruitless attempt to induce Henry to submit the case to a court of cardinals in Europe, which proclaimed that the dispensation of Pope Julius was perfectly valid, and that the marriage with Catherine was legal. The gauntlet had been thrown, and the second queen, who had so lightly thought her goal gained when that crown had been placed upon her head, perceived herself in an interminable struggle but the Pope and all Europe were as nothing to her if only she could keep her place in Henry's affection. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of the Favor of Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE FAVOR OF KINGS by May Hastings Bradley CHAPTER Twenty Seven, THE WRITING ON THE WALL The months passed. There were months of feastings and revelry at court, a feverish merry-making where Anne seemed sometimes to herself to be in a very treadmill of dancing. She lived lightly, from moment to moment, shutting out the future from her mind with a furious concentration of hope. She prayeth nightly for a prince, Mary Wyatt confided sadly to Helen as the two sat sewing one rainy afternoon. Nightly, Helen gave back, she prayeth that prayer hourly, I'll warrant, I, every instant in every jaded bone of her. There was a certain grimness in her tone that Mary noticed, her lip curved in a gentle pity for Anne. The years had made little change with her. She had remained the same sweet, gentle girl, her lines of thought unaltered, but a little deepened, her habits more settled, her goodness verging sometimes on pretty primness. The court had left her unspoiled. She accepted it literally, with literal simplicity, and had passed through it diffidently as she passed through life, holding Anne's train. A prince would save her, went on Helen even as a prince would have saved Catherine, but Anne hath not so many years to wait. She must haste. Spain is her deadly enemy, and its fiery emperor is egging on the new pope. Peace to Clement's ashes. 
I fear collar over our second queen hastened his demise. And France, seeming to expostulate, is doing little but look on. In truth, I think the three powers are but all shuffling and looking on and hesitating to see what new thing the morrow will bring forth in Anne's fortunes. For when Henry tires, and his humors are well known, why then they think he will undo all that he has done of a schism, and then there will be no more need of threats and bulls and fulminations. And will he? asked Mary humbly, as of a seeress. Helen shook her head. It is my mind that he will ne'er retreat from any pinnacle he hath perched on. Parliament hath declared him head of the Church of England, and that he will cling to however he discard his queens. But if Anne had a son, he would grapple him to him as with hoops of steel, and then would her dangers be past. And the powers, seeing him so fixed, would accept his mind and vie for that son's hand. It is a very irony of fate which withholds from Anne the boys that every thatched roof cottage bursts with. She taketh it very hard, the girl sighed. Those who know her not say she is light. They would not say so, and they had seen her as I have. Nay, she is not light, Helen agreed. Mary clasped her hands in her earnestness. She sitteth silent in the garden, hour by hour, among the dogs, and how much she distributeth in alms. I pray God that he send her a son, she said. Pray on. She needeth it, Helen advised dryly. Helen was the same, only a little leaner, a little drier, a little more caustic than of old. Mary sat silent a moment, thinking. Again she sighed. It is not so fine to be a queen after all is said, she mused. Indeed, I think she would have been happier as a simple maid. Helen eyed her quizzically. Do you indeed? Now I suppose thou art thinking of Percy of Northumberland. Thou wast ever the maid for a love sigh, though thou art so shy with thy own Lee. Nay, Mary denied. He could not have made her happy, I think. That was but a girl's fancy. I think, she said softly, that if my brother had been free, there would have been no Percy Northumberland, nor, nor any one else. She finished with another quick look about to reassure herself that they were alone. A queer look came to Helen's face. He hath always loved her, Mary went on. He told me once how he first saw her on her return from France, and the sight of her went to his heart and ever lodged there. It has always been the same. I know that he has hoped on through the years, thinking that something might happen to break off this match, and that he might be free his wife has such ill health, and that his chance would come. I will ne'er forget how he felt when she was crowned. Wyatt does not ope his heart to the world, but I have always known it, and I know that it aches now. He is anxious about Anne. He told me that he would give his right arm if it would bring her her heart's desire. Wyatt is a noble soul. The irony of Helen's voice seemed strangely muffled. She looked old and weary. There is, there is much love amiss in this world, she said dryly. I thought he was perchance taking some thought of little Margaret, Mary went on. I know tis not the same, but twould lighten him. Margaret Shelton? Yes, he taketh her to dance a good deal, I note, and maketh much of her. Helen laughed, rather disagreeably. Think again, Mary. For me, I do not think our little cousin was imported from Hatfield with the country do still in her eyes to beguile thy brother's leisure moments. Her highness needed her nearer home. And as Mary stared uncomprehendingly, Helen sharply elucidated, she is for the king's consumption. Mary's eyes widened, filling with surprise. Then she shook her head very positively. How strange you talk, Helen. Why, how can you think? Do you mean that Mrs. Shelton... The Duke of Norfolk? But Anne must understand. She would not let them overreach her like that. You know how she will brook no rival. Mrs. Shelton, Duke of Norfolk, repeated Helen scoffingly. Nay, indeed, Anne is not being overreached. Our pretty little country cousin is no rival, but a tool. It was some time before Mary understood. 
Helen went on to throw explanation at her. Could the Norfolks have foisted the girl on Anne if she had not wisted? Didn't she herself exploit her? When Anne and the King came back from that trip about the country this summer, how did things stand? And do what Anne could, she could keep him no longer from that girl that Nicholas Carew eggs on to seek his majesty. And if she kept in power, Lord knows where she and all the Boleyn faction would be. I tell thee, things were black and Anne was not well. And she let Margaret come and gave thanks, I'll vow, when her freshness caught the king's taste. Have you not noticed how frequent he is of late? Did you suppose it was Anne again? Anne sits by, perhaps, but, but tis the girl he's ogling. And Mistress Carew hath clean toppled out of his memory. The girl will not last long. She is a little shallow piece, all giggles and pretty airs, but by then Anne will be fresh matter to him again, and she will have kept him in her party. But the girl, the pitying heart of Mary Wyatt protested, Oh, the girl! Helen swept that pity summarily away. She will not break her heart over that matter. She is tickled nigh to death at the notice and fuss she is receiving. She'll have her day and marry some young gallant. Norris, our handsome widower, has an eye on her now. She is a soft piece, like Mary Carey. Mary Carey, Anne's sister, a widow for some six years now, had lately married again, and there was some haste to have the ceremony catch up with her good name, if indeed she had any left. Whom was it she married? Mary Wyatt murmured after a pause. Some officer, an unknown, for she hath a talent for obscurity that Anne doth not share. Mary is all whispers and twilight. Anne is for the sunshine. Mary looked thoughtful, but it was not at this summing up. She was considering Helen gravely. I have oft wondered at you, Helen, she said gently, that your own heart hath never been touched. You speak ever so disdainfully of the affection's weakness. You seem to stand and look on. I have thought that perhaps some man would some day change you. But you are never pricked. Helen laughed harshly. Perhaps I am in secret nursing my own love wound, she mocked. Perchance an undying desire possesseth me. Perchance I have given all in vain. Is that not a tale to bring your lamb's tears? Mary shook her head wisely. Nay, then, you would be different, she said. You would have more compassion on the sufferings of others. Would I, said Helen, with her sharp-edged smile. Helen had spoken truly. Margaret Shelton had been a tool, a bright decoy, keeping Henry in the ranks of his wife's friends. That Anne should stoop to employ such means, that her pride should lend itself to such assistance, showed a strange change from the Anne of other days. She bore herself as proudly and lightly as ever. Her wit struck as audacious sparks. Her laughter rang as free, but it was laughter with a defiant echo, and the big eyes that looked out from the thinned oval of her cheeks were bright with a feverish fire. She was a person constantly on the alert, constantly expecting some summons on the qui vive of attention. When she was in her rooms or believed herself alone in the gardens, she sat for a long time with gripped hands and locked lips, her eyes fixed, turning over plan after plan in her restless mind. She carried anxiety about her like a fox in her vitals. And then came the day when she drew the freest breath that she had known in years, when she felt suddenly like a prisoner who steps out of doors, his chains undone, when it seemed to her that at last the corner of her long lane had been turned and that pinnacle which she had been at such trouble to attain was finally hers in undisputed possession. The woman whom she had displaced, whose life had been one constant strife with her and hers, ceased suddenly to be. She had been ailing for some time. So near her end did she believe herself at one time to be that Chapuy, the Spanish ambassador, rode out and spent four days with her. But as she then appeared to be recovered, and in such cheerful spirits, he had returned. But two days later she failed again, fell into a heavy doze, and on a Friday morning, the 7th of January, 1536, she passed peacefully away. Catherine of Aragon was gone. 
Anne said it over and over to herself, with almost incredulous gladness. She was gone. Never in her life had Anne known such a sensation of relief. By its very poignancy, she appreciated how keen had been her apprehensions. She remembered how welcome once had been the news of Wolsey's death. That emotion, by the side of this intensity, appeared childish. What had she known then of actual fear and trouble, she asked rather scornfully of that other Anne she summoned to vision. She recalled a girl, proud-eyed, impatient for the crown, and she shook her head contemptuously at that girl's cares and crosses. What a slight, inexperienced creature she was, after all. How little she knew of life, life as this older woman knew it. There were only nine years between those selves, but nine times nine of bitter experience. She had never thought of herself as very inexperienced, very young and childlike. Indeed, she had felt a superb confidence in her own immense adequacy to all intricacies, but now she looked back on that younger Anne, as something pitiably fresh and virginal, dancing with sun-dazzled eyes. How she had striven! How she had suffered! How she had sunk! She had done things from which that light-hearted Anne would have shrunk in horror. She thought of Margaret Shelton, and of herself and Henry. Well, the worst was over now. That other who had disputed her queenship and her wifehood was gone the way there is no returning and her shadow would rest no more upon that throne. She was undisputed queen. Surely now the powers would make no more difficulties about their marriage. Starting up, Anne gave breathless orders to her ladies. They should wear their prettiest gowns, no mourning, yellow, the color of rejoicing. We will have no lies here, she said stoutly, clasping on her jewels. Henry, too, when he came to dine with her, was in fine attire. He was jocular, and called for more than even his usual allowance of wine. In a burst of uproarious relief, he toasted Catherine's progress through hell. A sudden reaction swept through Anne. She sat still, her glass untasted. She had never been very close to death, but its solemn mystery had made a strong appeal to her imagination. At Henry's words, she had a sudden vision of that silent room at Kimbolton, where the Spanish women were on their knees, and of the sheeted mass upon the bed. Clearly, as if it were before her, she saw that scene. Somewhere, a bell tolled slowly, dismally, and she could not have told whether it were ringing in truth or in this fancied scene. She remembered not seeking the memory that the man who offered this toast had been the husband of that sheeted dead, had kissed her lips, had clasped her children. Like an icy wave, a swift and terrible impression went through her. She shuddered, the room darkened and seemed to totter about her, her wine-glass dropped and fell, pouring the wine like blood in a thin stream. She swayed, and her ladies kept her from falling. In an instant she opened her eyes, Henry had come swiftly about the table and was bending over her. She received from him a horrible impression of reddened flesh and liquor-laden breath, of something panting and soulless and wolfish. She tried to smile, but she shivered. "'It is nothing,' she said, and drew her hand from his hot grasp. "'It is but my condition.' On the twenty-ninth of January— there was laid to rest in Peterborough Cathedral a woman whom the ceremonial described as the widow of the late Prince Arthur of England. Therefore the Spanish ambassador declined to be present, and the body was followed only by those attendants who had shared its long exile and misfortune. Anne Boleyn could not put from her mind the thought of the ceremony which was going on. She was unfeignedly thankful at Catherine's death, she would not for worlds have restored her to life or her former position, and she had not the slightest intention of dwelling morbidly on the details of her final rites. She had no love for horrors. But she could not keep her fancy from playing about this. She could imagine the finalities of the service and the ring of feet on the hollow vaulted stones of the cathedral. She thought of death with wonder and awe. It was a very mysterious thing. She thought that it was strange that this was really the last of Catherine, and somehow an unbidden, repudiated pity for Catherine 
the woman who had worn her crown and who was now being put away in a distant aisle of Peterborough, stole through her. She tried to lay it by firing her resentment with a memory of the wrongs Catherine had done her, but she remained curiously cold. The woman could not be blamed for clutching the crown she had worn so long. She had been a fool to do it, that was plain. She had embittered her own condition and wrecked her daughter's hopes by maintaining that lost cause of her rights. She had been clearly in the wrong, of course, and should have recognized and been grateful, Anne felt that she had been so long allowed to wear the crown that had never been rightfully hers. Yet it had been natural, natural, Anne's rebellious mind could not but feel, and Anne went suddenly back to those old days to wake a deep-rooted hate. She recalled that terrible day when she had pled, and Catherine had scorned, and her anger woke again, even against the dead and self-pity stirred. Yet the next instant her truant thought swerved, she wondered ironically at her own despair, and smiled with dry eyes at those tears that had poured for Henry Percy. She recalled the erratic, aloof, and unconfiding man who too late had entered into the earldom of Northumberland, and she wondered fleetingly what had been his inner life. And as that old scene came back to her, the queen's chamber, the embroidery frames by the window, and the meek-faced ladies— she thought how amazing life was, and how unforeseen and dramatic its contrasts. How little that queen, bending over her embroidery in placid meditation, dreamed that the maid of honor at her knees would one day wrest that crown from her and wear it in her stead. Would move as queen about those very rooms while she herself was being lowered into a vault at Peterborough, prepared for the widow of Prince Arthur. Life was strange. Anne mused on the common fact, as if she herself had discovered it. But that maid of honor, she reflected, had paid well for that crown. How she had waited, had striven and planned and fallen back, only to strive again, and always laughing, always with an unconquered mien. Yes, she had paid. To escape from the thoughts that hummed unbidden in her consciousness like a swarm of bees, Anne rose and moved restlessly about her chambers. The continual presence of her attendants irked her. She felt the need of being alone, and slipped away from them. At the end of the chain of rooms, a tiny anteroom, five-sided, was tucked into the space between the reception chamber and the corridor, a place where waiting courtiers might kick their heels while their betters discussed matters within. Anne threw open the door into the room suddenly, and what she saw there— bathed in the glow of a ruddy fire, held her chained a moment on the threshold. Sprawled in a great chair was her husband, one stalwart arm clasping the waist of a woman on his knees, who leaned lightly away from him, a playful smile on her small, demure features. The woman was Jane Seymour. In the tense silence that followed, the smile dropped, like a flung garment from Jane's face and fright and malice and smug assurance looked out her little eyes as both she and Henry hung in motionless discomfiture on the queen's white and staring countenance. Then Anne's voice rose in a ghastly rattle of laughter. "'Oh, God! Oh, God!' she cried, gasping wildly in a shrill mockery of mirth. "'Oh, God! My maid of honor!" With a shaking of superstitious terror she looked at them, and it was a very vision of the quicksands on which the tinsel edifice of her life was built, those quicksands which had closed so remorselessly over her predecessor. Was this the hand of God, his writing on the wall? It seemed as if her very soul shuddered within her, while about her the room grew first blood-red, then a darkness. Still eerily laughing, she made a staggering step to the door. Oh, rise not, I beg of you. Such needless mummery of respect fell chokingly from her, for a movement had stirred that pair in the chair. Then, with arms outstretched, she fled totteringly back through the anterooms. And again there came back to them the wail of her laughter and the bitter cry, O oh God, my maid of honor. The little form of the dead prince, so prematurely brought into the world that day, had been huddled unceremoniously into a final resting place. 
Anne was lying in the great bed, so slight a form that the clothes scarcely marked her presence. Her eyes, turned past the group of ladies who sat lamenting about her, rested on the square of out-of-doors that the casement framed. Amy Gainsford and Mary Wyatt were tearfully whispering together. Helen sat in dreary silence, while Margaret Shelton, plunged into the midst of such solemn misfortunes, did her young best to act the proper sympathy with lowered voice and appropriate sighs. Anne did not speak to them, and something in the gaze of those dark eyes hushed their own words, and held them from addressing her. Straight past them she gazed, and out of the window where joyous little white clouds were scudding along a sky of deepest blue. Down in the court, a dog was joyously barking. Someone dear to his doggish heart had come in sight. The pigeons cooed under the eaves. From beyond the closed doors came a subdued hum of voices like bees in clover. A wry smile sped across Anne's pain-drawn features, and the sight unlocked the tongues about her. Her stepmother came hastily with creaking footsteps to her side. "'Do you want aught, dearie?' Anne shook her head, her eyes half closing with weariness, and then Mary Wyatt burst out crying, honest, childish sobs that filled the room. "'O oh, holy virgin! O oh, holy virgin!' she iterated chokingly. The old dowager duchess of Norfolk, who loved Anne like a daughter, suddenly broke the control of years, and caught her breath in a whimpering sigh, openly wiping her eyes. Like a flash, Anne's eyes unclosed. "'Weep not!' she said, and a spark of her old imperious will made itself felt through the weak voice. Nay, weep not. There might have been disputes about this child, being a child of Catherine's lifetime. There can be no question about the next. Her spirit was tremendous, yet strangely it did not cheer them. They felt her indomitable flash of courage, but it saddened rather than enheartened them. It was like some lost cause, fluttering its pennant before overwhelming odds. Helen rose suddenly and left the room. The king came at last to the door. Anne shifted quickly on her pillow. One hand went restlessly to her disordered hair. Her lips tightened. A steady smile curved them. Henry went abruptly to her bedside. She looked up at him, and the smile rested on her lips like some butterfly pinned on a mask of agony. She had not seen him since she had closed the door of that anteroom, and she had seen him then with Jane Seymour on his knees. There was a frightful menace now in his look. He was furiously angry. He felt himself cheated and outraged, and he could wreak his rage on no one but that prostrate woman before him who had thus dashed his hopes of a son. His lips curled away from his teeth, his nostrils dilated with his uneven breathing. Then he turned away as abruptly as he had come. "'When you get up, I will talk to you,' he flung from between his teeth. At the door, the dowager duchess made bold to put herself swiftly in his way. "'It was a son, your majesty,' she said in a low voice that was meant to appear and heartening, and that held a quiver of entreaty. "'The next will also be a son.' Henry flung a malignantly sullen look at the aged woman. She will get no more sons by me, he muttered, and banged the door. End of section 27。Chapter 28 of The Favor of Kings。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by Mary Hastings Bradley Chapter 28 Rumors The Spaniard and Lady Exeter are talking together, and each time they ope their lips they bite at my poor name like this, and the Queen, her bare white elbows on the dark edge of the casement from which she looked down into the courtyard of Greenwich Castle, bit at the peach she held to her scarlet lips and a cat have nine lives. I vow I must e'en have nine and ninety characters, she murmured, for I still seem to have one left to be scratched at, no matter how many are destroyed. Your Majesty should take more care, observed Jane Seymour, in her soft practical tones. 
Indiscretion opens the door for calumny. Ay, but even the careful are not always so safe from slander. This is an evil world, Jane, and there are evil tongues, even here at court. The most careful are not spared. Why, you will never believe it, but rumor hath brought us strange tales even of thy careful self. Anne looked across at Jane from the window-seat where she had luxuriously disposed herself, bright malice in her dark eyes, in the curve of her gay lips. Never once in the months that had passed since that January day had Anne openly attacked her maid for that scene with the king, but her nipping wit had often played about the illusion in fitful enmity. She did not fear the girl now. That sudden panic and superstitious terror which had possessed her on first seeing Jane, ensconced as a rival in the king's affections, had fled on Henry's stout assurance that the demonstrativeness which his wife had witnessed had been but the impulse of a moment, when he had been too much in his cups, leaving only a mocking disdain for the placid little prig, as she termed her, whose suave flattery she bitterly surmised in spite of Henry's assurances was being voraciously swallowed by his glutton vanity. "'Monstrous tales, Jane,' she repeated gravely. "'I could have believed them of any of the court than of you, so trusty, so full of little saws of virtue. You must take more care. I trust you sent the purse back?' Jane, thus baited, had not the steel to strike sparks with. Her pale face turned reddish. She pursed up her lips, half primly, with a look of conscious forbearance, always irritating to her mistress. "'I hope I have in no wise laid mine own acts open to censure,' she said at last, as Anne was plainly waiting for an answer. "'Oh, I believe you, girl. Never defend yourself so blushingly. I believe you. But tis an evil world, and care is not enough for calumny. No, not even for the least attractive of us, Jane.' A smothered laughter rippled among the ladies, but they were not easy in mind. When Anne's tongue ran in this wise, there was no knowing where it would prick next, but the window drew her again. Ay, courtesy and pass on, my lady. Mark how the Spaniard smiles. Chapuis is monstrous pleased of a sudden, and how fine he is in his velvet doublet picked out with gold. Nay, on a day like this, with the wind so soft and so full of wood blossoms, I cannot more than half hate my enemies, as is my Christian duty to do. Ay, but how he hates me! Mary, if all who wished me ill were in procession to Canterbury, they would be the longest pilgrimage that Becket's tomb hath e'er seen. She stretched lazily, rising to her feet. My jewels, girls! "'Twill be a brave tourney to-day to welcome the May, "'and I must be gowned and adorned for these fine people. "'It may be that your Majesty's disdain hath pricked the Spaniard. "'He is a vain man, and thinks himself a wondrous fine one,' "'spoke up Mary suddenly, wondering how to slip her counsel into inoffensive words. "'But it would resound much to your Grace's credit and ease, "'and to the amusement of the court,' to gain the Spaniard now by a moment's affability. Oh, I will be affable enough, Anne promised. Now that this countrywoman is out of the way, he can bend the knee to me with a clear conscience, and I am in the mood, now, to be affable to the very devil himself, and I meet him on a May morning. Oh, I love spring. It was ever the time of year for me. Wyatt wrote me a verse on it, matching me with the season. My sweets with its sweets my favor with the inconstant breeze. T'was a pretty thing. Ah, never give the whole heart to a lover. Save it for a friend. Anne came slowly from the window, the brightness that the day had brought fading from her face. Absently she lent herself to the deft hands of her tire women. A sudden cloud seemed to have enveloped her. When her attendants were finished, with scarcely a glance at their work, she sent all from the room but Helen and Mary. "'Tell me,' she demanded imperiously, "'struck I truth in what I said to Jane? My page hath told me there was a purse sent, and from your glances while I spoke I saw ye knew the matter better than I. Come, out with it. Mary, for the love of me, let me not lack foreknowledge, and Helen, for love of thy tongue, spare me no hard truths.' 
Mary began. She was plainly distressed. There was a purse, so please your majesty. It doth not please my majesty at all, Anne told her with dry humor where lurked no mirth. Well, how many sovereigns sent that most generous sovereign? A goodly number, Helen reported. "'Twas well filled, and a letter came with it. It was a good chance for Jane's virtue. Tis said Carew and Seymour have been practicing her in modest arts, stuffing her mouth with well-sounding maidenly phrases. So down she went on her knees, handing back unopened the king's letter after she had bedewed it with grateful tears, beseeching the gentleman who had brought it to return it to the king, and to implore him in her name to remember that she was a gentlewoman sprung from a good and honorable stock, free from any taint whatever. O oh, Virgin Mary, murmured Anne, her eyes uprolled. She went on, with more tears, to say that she had no greater treasure in the world than her honor. She would do well to keep the purse, then, if that be all. And that not even fear of death would make her forget it. If the king wished to make her a present, let it be when God should send her some good and honest husband. God will have to look sharp to find one in England. Well, twas a fine show, Anne commented. Did it please his majesty? He loveth ever a show, even of virtue. Ay, he praised her, Mary murmured, said she had done well. And henceforward struck in Helen's mocking tones, that the luster of her good repute might not be breathed on, he swore to speak to her only in presence of her relatives. Our shrinking Jane. So now, my lord Cromwell, hath been dispossessed of a room in the palace, and the father and mother of this new star are there lodged. Tis the room, I mean, that is accessible by the secret staircase by the king's room. So our most scrupulous delicacy will entail no loss upon our honest love. Helen laughed in scornful mirth, her eyes on the queen. Anne's quick color was burning in her thin cheeks, her eyes bright and hard her nostrils dilating with the anger that shook her, but on which for once she shut her lips. She that was on his knees was all she flung out, and it was the first time she had opened her mouth on that to any one but Henry. My thanks for your kind and true report, she added, and her air dismissed them. Yet at the door she called them back. Heard ye what gentlemen of the kings brought her that purse? Twas not Norris or Weston or Brereton, or any one of my friends that should have told me? Nay, twas a new fellow, a young equerry that Carew recommended to his grace but last week. Tis said he hath gained much in favor, and Norris and Weston are not so well advised of the king's mind. Ah, Anne nodded her head thoughtfully. At the door again, Mary turned by with timid encouragement. Tis not thought the lady hath yielded aught, she began, when Anne threw out with a fierceness that told of the strain within, God grant she would. Then as they raised the curtain before the door, she motioned them again to wait. You spoke of his honest love, Helen. The word was not mine own, the girl answered with an inflection of irony. Twas the expression that his majesty made use of. She let her eyes rest fixedly on Anne's face as she saw the other did not heed her but was staring off somewhere into space. Mary stood looking down into her locked fingers. Then with a short laugh Anne roused, and turning to meet their gaze, she forced a smile of insolent security. "'Can there be two queens in England?' she proudly asked. A short pause before Helen's answer came, low and smooth-tongued. "'There hath been, your highness.' The woman's eyes crossed. In Anne's anger and arrogance cloaking a strange something that fluttered obscurely in their depths, nothing but pale green-gray surface to Helen's. Then Anne's answer came, sharp as a sword thrust. There shall not be again. In a moment she added, And lest I be not the one, I pray you, Helen, of your great love to be my taster from henceforward. Now, go. I will come presently. How could you speak to her so, the gentle Mary questioned, in reproof and awe, as the door closed behind them. Helen smiled grimly. She needeth to be roused. 
Your tongues would drug her with flattery. She is a woman dancing on a fire. So far her garments are but scorched. What did she mean, the other girl pondered, by crying out so sharp, God grant she would? Ha! Huh. Know you not how the king wearies of what he possesseth? An hour's possession palls, but a chase keepeth him afield forever. Tis a game my lady played herself for some seven year. This one does not mean to play it so long, belike. The king hath more experience. He hath learned through his success, and this time he hath no such dangerous opponent as the emperor's aunt. Nay, Cromwell will try to find some way for him if Jane proves steadfast, and Carew will see to it that she does. Her highness had best look out, she finished abruptly, as the other ladies in waiting neared them. His honest love. That was the phrase which kept echoing over and over again in Anne's mind. It grated ominously upon her. She was defiant of rumors of her abandonment or divorce or displacement, but this pricked through her surface hardihood. It was not Jane, the implement she feared, but the unresting venom of the men who were striking at her through Jane. Oxford, Norfolk, her uncle, Suffolk, Carew, were all leaders of that long procession she had pictured so laughingly a few moments ago. They had all been her friends, or called themselves such, in the past, when her favor could help them up the slippery ladder of their ambitions. But when she had achieved her own success and dominated them, their envy had turned them to secret hatred, and now that the king's fancy veered, they were all hand in glove with the new favorite from whom rewards might now be expected urging her on, surrounding the king with opportunity, and spreading themselves and their incessant activities like an impervious net between Anne and the king. It had been weeks since she had seen the king alone. She knew what men to thank for it. Now it appeared she had more to thank them for. They were teaching Jane coyness and ambition, and Henry assurance. What did it mean? She stood wrapped in thought, then, at a knock on the door, she threw back her head and straightened her shoulders as if flinging off a perching imp of care. "'Viscount Rockford,' said Mary's voice. George entered slowly and looked back at the door under the curtain to be sure that it was fast before he advanced into the room. Then he came forward and stood leaning on the back of a carved chair, dangling his small plumed cap in his hand and staring down into that with a frown in dark contrast with his holiday attire. Anne looked sharply at him. Well, George, what brings you now? I thought you were well on your way to the tourney. I want a word with you, sister. What is Cromwell up to? Cromwell? His same tricks of state, mayhap? Tis something out of the usual, I'll be bound, by the bustling and sly winks and headshakes. A while agone, he was at outs with Henry, and now he has won back to confidence, close as a shift, and he's forever at parley too with Norfolk and Exeter, who hate us, ay, and Carew's in it too. The damned beast! George broke off to exclaim bitterly that he should have that order of the garter in my stead. Odds blood, Anne, why could you not keep the king agreeable enough for that? Anne began to pace up and down the room, her scarlet gown swishing around her nervous feet. I, she tossed back at him, Mary, blame all your own mischances upon me. You had had some falling out yourself with Henry. I swear I had not. I was honey itself, but he took that chance of putting his spite upon you. Tis like you to think so, Anne cried, exasperated. Prithee, may not some tricksy word of thine own have undone thee. You never know on what Henry's spite rests. Her brother shrugged sulkily. In his pettishness there was such a touch of youthfulness. He looked so like an angry boy with his scowling brow under his careful curls that the flash of resentment died in Anne and was succeeded by a look of tolerant affection. Ah, well, she said. What if it were I to blame? It is not my fault. I cannot gauge all Henry's humors. Lord, I was furious enough. To slight thee and honor that Nicholas Carew. She drew an angry breath. 
The scandal-monger, she brought out again, pacing the room, the scandal-monger, the spreader of lies, the buzzard of all good fame, Nicholas Carew. I would liefer it were the knave Cromwell, or Exeter, or the fiery Spaniard, than that black bird of ill omen. You may well say ill omen, said her brother with a touch of grimness. I think this bodes us no good. The puppy, she snapped. I should have had his head long since. You should, for now the puppy hath grown a set of teeth. There are strange tales afloat. Everywhere are rumors. I know them of old. The king is cooling. La, she gave a contemptuous laugh. Those tales are old enough to have beards, and never one of them fathered a fact. His eyes followed her with a trace of anger. It is all well enough for you to throw them off so, but I think we are in an ill way. Our uncle has grown to hate us. Now we stand in his path, and many are with him. And you are too far out with Henry. Out with Henry, she scoffed. La, George, I shall be in again before ye cry Jack Robinson. It is the same talk I have heard so much. Look how it was after that poor little dead child of mine was born last January. Was not Henry in such a rage that it was said he would never enter my door again? Was I not supposed to be as good as dead and buried and forgotten, and the willows blooming over my grave? Ha! Was your sister so downed? I was up ere my legs could well carry me, and what I lacked for color I borrowed of a clever rouge, and I held court with my head high. And I praised the king's hunting till he was red with joy. Do I know the rule to win him? Only spread the jam, and he will swallow whatever bitter may lie beneath." "'Well, you do not spread it often enough, then. "'If it is easy to win, why cannot you keep him one?' "'Her brother taunted. "'Ye have it ever to do over again. "'Look how that fool of Wolsey's reviled you in open court.' "'Anne's lips trembled. "'That memory pierced her like a knife. "'She saw the painted face, the lean, fantastic form of Patch, "'and his jiving words intoned through his nose.' the words that called both her and her daughter the foulest names women can wear. Anne's breath came stormily, though she controlled her voice. One cannot prevent the words of a fool. Henry was furious. The fellow was obliged to hide. Yes, and where hid he? With Nicholas Carew, George ground out with an angry oath. Anne struck the table a sudden blow that sent her bracelets clanking. Carew again? Oh, what a score I have against him. If Henry was so angry, why did he not punish the fellow when he showed his head again? Because Henry does nothing when his blood hath cooled, Anne bitterly owned. You must heat him to get deeds. His humor, as doubtless ye have observed, George, is subject to change. I would for God's sake that you would change it again to our favor, or at least away from that Seymour jade. Jane! Poof! Anne laughed with a bravado her heart did not share. She is nothing. She is nothing good for us, Rockford sullenly persisted, and I know your gracious highness is not so easy either. Remember how you railed when you found her wearing a portrait of the king about her neck. Oh, tut, a moment's spleen. Anne's pride made light of her own jealousy. His fancy will pass, I tell you. It will pass, she insisted. Heaven send so soon. When hast thou seen him alone? Thou knowest it hath not been of late. They ever keep him off. Come, out with it, George. What fear is in thy head? Such fears as are bred by the last treaty. The treaty? Anne repeated. Why, well, there has been none signed. There was talk of one, but Henry balked at the terms. Let me tell you it was no terms that Henry balked at, but the presumption that he had been in the wrong and had ill-treated Charles. His vanity holds him fast there. For his pride's sake he will rest not till the emperor hath made full acknowledgment that there hath been no ill done. Cromwell is very insistent on this treaty with Spain. He labored with him near all Easter day, and he and Audelay were in tears when it was all for naught. Three days later, when the privy council on their knees to a man like a row of flowers urged the Spanish alliance, do you know what Henry said? I had rather lose my crown than admit I have done wrong. Why, what is there in that? It looked good to me as supporting me. Wait. 
Cromwell took to his bed from sorrow. The council was in great straits. The Spaniard wrote his arm off to his master, recommending Charles to leave Henry to his obstinacy, to come to terms with France, and let the Pope issue his bull of deposition. How know you what he wrote? Sure he told one that told another, and mine own wife taunted me with it as we met, as we ever meet, by chance. Mary, what of it? Anne urged impatiently. We have had bulls and briefs these three years past, so they become our daily bread. Aye, but this one has a little leaven in it that will e'en leaven the loaf for you, sister. Leaning closer, Rockford uttered with slow emphasis, Neither Francis nor Charles is to regard as legitimate any child the king might have either by, thou knowest the word they use for thee, tis the same the gesture shrieked or by any other woman whom he might marry during thy lifetime, unless by dispensation from the Pope, which Henry will never seek. What logic is that? Anne scornfully flung back. Either I am the king's wife, or I am not. If they say I am not, why will they not regard as legitimate his marrying another? Logic is not the weapon of the powers. Anne shut her mouth on some retort, staring at her brother under knit brows. His eyes were fixed on her, and under their searching her own face did not waver. Hm, she said at last coolly. I think the Princess Elizabeth will sleep as sound for all that. Perchance thou art missing the point. Oh, no, she laughed disdainfully. I see. Twill not be enough for Henry to put me away. He must e'en pack the earth o'er me. She laughed again. It is not so excellent a jest as it may appear, my lady, he warned her bitterly. You had better have a royal taster, or win Henry back. Why, tis really a compliment, brother. See you that they know I am never defeated until I am out of breath for good and all. As long as I live, they know I would be taken back. She threw back her head proudly and fixed a look of haughty confidence on her brother. They know no matter how they separate us that I am never outdone. My day would come. I would win him again. Win him now? Why, so I shall. There was no need for you to twang on that like a harp with one string. Have I lost him so far? Tut, because a moment of spleen he gave the garter to thy rival, thou art not to suppose that he is lost. The matter is not so difficult if only I can see him but once alone. Have I changed so since the day he crowned me queen? She drew herself up, turning her proud face to him in arrogant bravado, daring inspection, a smile curving her lips, a light of daring and of triumph in her sparkling eyes. She made so splendid a figure, the great ruby rising and falling at her throat with her scornful breath, the diamonds flashing in her dark hair like fireflies in a net the hair that seemed almost too great a weight for that small head and delicate neck to bear, so vivid an embodiment of all that was regal and imperious and enchanting that Rockford's features relaxed their grim tension. Ay, you are fair enough, he admitted, but you will need more than bright eyes and light feet to keep your place. You talk like a fool, brother, she retorted composedly. Are we mice in a trap? Am I queen of England, or am I not? If I have the wit to make me queen, and God knows it was shrewd work all those years, then have I not the wit to keep me once I have worn the crown? Come, come, you are dreaming, man. You have been drinking too many horns. Your nerves are on edge. Anne had talked herself into good humor and confidence. The admiration she had read in his grudging brotherly eyes strengthened her sense of security. "'It is no dream,' retorted her brother sullenly, that Cromwell, in his rage at Henry for outstanding him about the treaty, breathed into the Spaniard's ears, who breathed it to a woman who breathed it to me, that Henry's obstinacy placed them in a pretty fix, and it was necessary to appease the papacy, and other things being so, the time had come for him to set the match to the powder.' He said you would be out of the saddle in three days. Anne answered his apprehensive emphasis with a laugh. We'll match his powder with some of our own, she declared. 
a fine confection secured from France. So think no more about it. You shall see me hereafter at Henry's side, all soft words and honeyed devotion. You are right. I have perchance scamped my bounden duty, and been too honest in my pride. I'll make amends, and wear a heavier yoke. She sighed in weariness, then turned to the clock upon the fireplace. If I can but see him to-day at the tourney. Run along now, brother. I must not begin by being late. George hesitated a moment. Then, instead of going, he came a little closer to her. A curious diffidence seemed to hedge his speech. "'Hath not Carew made love to you?' he muttered, as he looked down at his hat. Anne sniffed. "'It hath been a constant practice of his.' "'Nay, but I mean of late. "'Made he not some advances? "'I remember that thou didst say something to me, Anne. "'Why, yes, I told thee. "'The knave had the assurance to come to me craving an appointment.' "'Her face grew dark.' A contemptuous curve twisted her lips into a line of disdain. He was as mad as a March hare. I would have ruined him with Henry with it, but Henry was in the mood to turn on me for listening. And then, even as I hate the knave, I cannot undo him with what he cannot help. Did he threaten thee? He always threatens. George looked at her out of dark and weary eyes. Couldst thou not conciliate him with a, a show of consent? he muttered. Nay, I mean no real harm, for he saw the flash in Anne's face. But grant him soft words, or, or, well, you need not scorn him so witheringly as thou hast always done. So I am to go to school to you, brother, for soft ways of rejecting dishonor, Anne said under her breath. She looked at her brother, and in the shamed and defiant glance that refused to meet hers, but flitted past like a thing of darkness, she read the dark thing that was at the back of her brother's mind, which even his lips refused to bring into the light. She caught her breath. For a moment there was silence. "'You are indeed unnerved,' she said quietly. "'Dost thou think I will pander with that knave? "'Soft words. He hath no desire for words.' She grew calm again, quickly after that sudden flash. "'George, Thou art simple. Should I put my head into the lion's mouth? And were I so lost to pride and honor, so craven with fear that I should make appointments to that evil knave, how long before he or another would not apprise Henry of the fact, and declare that he had but been making test of mine integrity, or else pack the blame on another's shoulders? Am I a fool that I would give mine enemies one jot or tittle of truth against me? You talk as if I... I said not, declared George hastily. She gave him a look of dreadful sadness. Thy fear spoke, George. Now go, and trouble thyself no longer. It is a day of sun and good cheer. Before night thou shalt see thy sister in new estate. End of section 28「Chapter twenty nine of the Favor of Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by May Hastings Bradley. Chapter twenty nine. A Blow in the Dark. May Day was a day of such sweet spring loveliness, of such bright gaieties of sun and breeze and bird song that the anxious heart Anne guarded with her constant smiles became insensibly lightened. As she sat at the tourney in her chair of state, under the royal cloth of gold, the stir of life and laughter about her, the pageant of color and motion with its richly dressed throngs, its waving pennants and sun-flooded field, where the light sparkled on the glittering accoutrements of knights and horses, all served to engage her mood and banish all that was uneasy and apprehensive. Impossible to be dismal on a day like this. Impossible that dark things should happen. Leaning forward at some crisis in the encounter, she caught Henry's glance and sent a swift smile at him over her lady's heads. He smiled back. What hope that shifty, evasive curve of his lips begot. 
She flouted the last remnant of her anxiety. What had she to fear? She would regain him yet, if only she could see him alone. That was the essential, and that was exactly what her enemies took such bitter care to prevent. Surrounding him on all sides from her, leading him hither and yon on his new love quests, opposing a continual barrier of distraction and revelry. But her time would come. It must come. She would make it come. Rockford and Norris were the challengers that day, and they were performing miracles of valor. As Norris, after three times splintering the lances of their successive opponents, was riding triumphantly past the royal stands, bowing to the applause and acclaim, the queen's handkerchief slipped from her hand and fluttered to the ground. Norris raised it skillfully on his lance, and Anne caught it from its point. At that moment she was aware of a disturbance in the king's stand. Henry had risen from his place and was preparing to depart. Her heart sank, and sharp disappointment gripped her as she realized that their chance of meeting was indefinitely receding. In helpless chagrin she watched him mount and ride off, attended only by Norris, who had hastily laid aside his mail at the command to accompany his sovereign. From a page she learned that they were returning to London. The sunshine went out of the day. The sports, continued by Rockford, left alone to defend the lists, proceeded half-heartedly for a few moments. Then Anne, too, rose and returned to Greenwich Castle with her ladies. The gentlemen were making haste to follow the king. Norfolk and Paulet, however, and a small group of their satellites, appeared to be remaining. As Anne entered the castle she saw them standing talking closely together in a court. She found something more than usually significant in their aloof and confidential demeanor and the glances of secure arrogance that they cast upon her in her passing seemed to hint at withheld knowledge. At ten that night there arrived at Greenwich a breathless and disheveled rider. It was Roland Bulkley, a lawyer of Gray's Inn. He asked to be shown at once to the Queen, and Anne kept him waiting but a few minutes. She knew him for a devoted friend. She received him alone with Madge Shelton, clad in a silver-gray dressing-gown, her heavy hair hanging in disordered curls about her. Her eyes, so darkly large in her thinned face, expressed a sharper anxiety than she knew. Bulkley had dropped on one knee to deliver his errand. He was out of breath, and his face was streaked with sweat and dust. "'There be strange doings in London,' he panted out. "'Methought your grace should know with all speed. So I—' "'You come from my brother?' she shot at him. "'Nay. No harm has touched him? None to my knowledge. "'Ah!' she drew a breath of relief. "'Say on, then, and put me quickly out of mine impatience. "'Your Highness, it is sad, sad tidings. "'This night was Master Norris committed to the tower. "'Norris!' she echoed blankly. "'Norris! Why, man, thou art raving. "'I myself saw him right off as usual with the king this afternoon.' He is in the tower, the lawyer sadly insisted. The tower? Why, why, for why? He shook his head, still kneeling at her feet. Oh, speak on, there must be rumor flying. What is said? What is whispered? Is there no reason known? Naught is known. All are in wonderment. And Mark Smetton hath also been sent there. What, to the tower? Mark, my little player? Why, this is madness. What hath the lad done? Come, rise. What means it? Bulkley rose slowly to his feet, shaking his head dejectedly at her questions. She stood and stared at him, racking her mind for an explanation. I have heard whispered, though tis but rumor, the lawyer presented hesitantly, that tis for some sort of complicity with your grace. Complicity? Complicity? For God's sake, what talk is this? But he could not say. He had heard only excited murmurs of a plot. Some said against the Queen, some that the Queen had share in it. That was all he knew, but his alarm was infinite. A plot, Anne repeated, as if the sound of the word would help her wits. She tried to keep calm, to think clearly and very quickly, but her darting surmises could strike out no path of explanation. It was a blow in the dark. Norris and Smetton. Why those two? A most unlikely pair to be involved together in a plot. A hireling musician and the king's intimate. 
one of the foremost gentlemen at court. Norris in the tower. It was incredible. Other incredibilities would follow in its train. What did it all mean? She shuddered in a nameless foreboding. She remembered the king's hasty departure, and Norfolk's ill-omened eyes upon her and her flesh pricked. She began to walk very rapidly up and down the room, gripping her hands against an hysterical temptation to wring them in her helpless distress. For she was utterly helpless. She was being conspired against. Her friends and dependents were being arrested and flung into the tower, and she was isolated at Greenwich, unable to know what was being done, unable to communicate with her adherents, unable to reach the king. Bulkley was powerless. He was only a lawyer of Gray's Inn, and his brother, Sir Richard, an intimate friend of Norris's, was absent in North Wales, where he was Knight Chamberlain. "'I will write my brother at once,' he said, "'and meantime I will back to London to see if there be news.' The smile that Anne gave him at parting was beautiful even in her distress. She had never wavered in her steady kindness to her friends, and it touched her now that one of the least of them should be so ready to pay that loving debt. And it augured that the others for whom she had done so much would rally swiftly to her. There was Weston, and Brereton, and Page, and Cranmer among those on whom she felt she could absolutely depend, and chief of all, her brother. But if she were struck at, would not the blow include her brother also? And what was it? What was impending? The terrible vagueness of her fear barbed its anguish. She had such a field of dread to choose from. She paced up and down, remembering her brother's warnings, facing one supposition after another. The thing that pierced her with the wildest apprehension was the king's passion for Jane Seymour. His honest love, he had said. They want my life, she said to herself again and again throughout that dragging, intolerable night. Each hour racked her with suspense. The morning, she felt, would bring the facts. She dreaded and longed for its menacing disclosures. Her ladies were weeping about her. Tearfully, they urged flight. There were ships in the river, they said. Let her take to one of them and put at once for sea. To what harbor? Anne demanded, flinging wide her arms. Would France or Spain grant me asylum? I, that have laughed Europe to scorn? And why should I fly? Would it not admit whatever thing they are planning against me? What mattereth what you admit? They are seeking your ruin. Go, go, for the love of heaven, Mary frantically besought. I cannot, and I will not, and I will not, and I can. Anne gave back. I am no coward. We will see what thing the morning brings us. What the morning brought was an order for the Queen to appear before a number of council of special commissioners to answer to charges of high treason against her. She had never heard before of these special commissioners who, it appears, had been secretly appointed two weeks before to investigate any treason in the realm. She found them represented by Norfolk and Paulet and Sir William Fitzwilliam, who had arrived at Greenwich during the evening. So this, then, was what Norfolk's eyes had boded. It was noon when she emerged from her encounter with that council, and she presented to her waiting ladies a face so pale, an aspect so charged with anger and disdain and secret terror, that their worst fears of the night seemed realized. She made a wild gesture to them. Pack up! Pack up! I am off to the tower! To the tower! Their stammering tongues gave back. Aye, I am under arrest, it seemeth. It would not be enough for these vile panderers, she flung out passionately, to rid me from Henry's path in any quiet or seemly way, with poison or assassination. No, the world would suspect him. His deeds would proclaim his complicity. They must needs make me my own executioner. He is to wed again, girls. Wed? Mary's quivering lips just formed the sound. Aye, the lady is my maid of honor, our modest Jane, our prudish preacher, our sly slip-up-the-back stairs. Did the council, Madge was beginning in bewilderment, tell me this? Anne laughed harshly. No, my love, they made no mention of his majesty's intentions. It was hardly needed. I know him so well. I can see a church door by daylight. They did but acquaint me with mine own misdeeds. My God, do you know what they accused me of? 
or it is past belief. You will be amazed at what hath gone on under your noses, and you never knew. According to the honourable gentleman in there, I have been wrong-doing with Norris and Smetton. Yes, Smetton, that hireling fellow, and another, they did not tell me his name. Perhaps they have not decided on him yet. They said they knew all, and I had best confess. Is it not a shrewd plot? Is it not well devised? An unworthy queen, to the tower with her. She hath deceived the king, off with her head. Poor king, how he hath been deceived. He must console himself if he can, and how well that there is another lady at hand. Let him wed, and trust this time to be rewarded for his noble faith. O oh God, was it not enough to strike me down, but they must strike down my honour too? I play the fool with those men. Had I the will to do so, the world knows I have the wit to keep my will from it. The fiends, the liars, they know they are liars, and they handled me cruelly. My uncle there, with the sneer on his false face, he would not listen to me, crying out, tut, 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 as if I had been a kitchen wench. Fitzwilliam, he that I have helped make, would not meet my eyes. He drummed on the table, pretending to be absent in mind. Paulet, yes, he showed me courtesy, but then he would bow a lady to the rack. They know they are liars, and this is a vile plot. A plot, ah, now I know why. That knave Cromwell was returned to favor. His was the brain that devised this. No wonder Henry smiled on him again. He first made his way by aiding crown a woman. Now let him hold his place by beheading her. Oh, why did I not make his head tumble long ago when I had the power? I have been too slack. I knew him all along. He had bragged smugly to me oft of his lack of scruple. He would sell the corpse of his mother. What is a woman to him? A woman, the poorest thing in England. Do I rave? Mary, you look frozen into a mask of fear. Bestir yourself, I shall need gowns and night shifts at the tower. Make my bag. What, Helen, no word even from you? And not one laugh to mock me? I can laugh. Yea, and I shall cry my innocence till they stop my mouth with clay. I will defy them to the end. She faced her women with the defiant mien that she had fronted her defamers. Then her eyes blazing, their fiery indignation seemed to fix suddenly on some point in the distance beyond them. They dilated and filled with terror. She drew a breath that was a groan. Elizabeth, she said in a voice of anguish. At two o'clock the tide served to convey her to the tower, and Anne stepped into the royal barge in company with Norfolk, Oxford, Lord Sandys, and a detachment of the guard. Her ladies were not permitted to accompany her. She sat alone, erect, disdainful, in that boatload of men, only once unclosing her lips on the journey. Then it was to ask that she should see the king. Norfolk replied with a contemptuous negative. The banks along the riverside were crowded with the populace who had heard the news, and rushed to see its truth for themselves. But Anne was very little conscious of the thousand eyes. She had the sensations of a person on a lofty height. Her head swam. The world was very far off and fantastically unreal. Her thoughts flitted in and out of her mind like rooks through a ruined belfry. Now she thought of the barge and the first time she had used it, going to her coronation, with Catherine's arms broken off it, to give place to her own. Her own. Happiest of women. She wondered if Jane would wrench hers away in turn and perch a crest of her own on that prow. She thought of Catherine and was glad that she had died before she had seen such humiliation come upon her supplanter. She looked at the cushions and remembered the day she had first seen that particular satin damask on the long tables at Whitehall, when she and Henry had gone to view Wolsey's treasures. Norris had been the king's only attendant. She could see Henry now, with one hand lightly on Norris's shoulder. She could see his eyes smile into hers. How little had she thought that day. Where was Henry now? Was he in London? What was happening there? She feared for her brother in his ardent loyalty to her. She feared, too, for her father, for though he could not be said to love her, Yet there was some affection, and he was her father. She thought of her friends, her real friends, and what they might be able to do to help her. But here was Norris, 
whom she had reckoned the staunchest and most influential already in the tower and threatened by the same sword that hung over her head a shrewd plot she thought while the frenzied terror of its possibilities chilled the blood about her heart to implicate the very one who would have struggled to free her she wondered in anguish who could be that third man whom the council had mysteriously accused without naming her fears pointed to wyatt report had always linked them yet he had been so little at court of late and so little with her surely none could tangle him in this she thought of brereton and weston and cranmer and richard bulkeley and the ways in which they might aid her but she thought of them without hope for the mind that had devised this terrible infamy to bring her low would as surely devise some further schemes to render those friends powerless her agony of helplessness deepened tragically in her as comprehension of her position more and more impressed itself upon her she was at the mercy of men utterly unscrupulous men who had seen fellow creatures racked without turning a hair utterly immoral unprincipled who boasted no higher aim than gratifying a monarch's whim who knew no higher law than expediency they had nothing to gain by protecting her and everything to lose it would be disaster or death to oppose the king's passion backed as it was now by cromwell's ruthless connivings she had too great a knowledge of the peers of england to hope anything from their justice at five the barge had reached the tower and paused at the traitor's gate a clock inside boomed out the hour as the doors opened the guard disembarked forming a narrow line for anne to pass through sir william Pauley extended a hand to her to assist her from the boat but she refused it she felt a tremor in her own that her pride refused to have discovered her knees were trembling it was by a supreme effort of the will that she rose and passed between the guarding files into what was to be her prison the counsellors followed Sir William Kingston received them, and consigning their royal charge to him, the three noblemen bowed and withdrew. Anne gazed after their departing figures. She watched the closing of the heavy door behind them, barring out the light of day, leaving her in a gloom that intensified the grim and forbidding aspect of the place. The chill of the stone beneath her feet struck the cold of fear into her. It rang hollow under her tread, as she advanced in the direction to which Kingston was silently beckoning her. Her heart failed as she remembered that this man, her jailer, was a devoted adherent of Mary, and ghastly visions of loathsome cells rose before her. She tried to command her voice to put a quiet question, but it quivered over the words. "'Art thou taking me to a dungeon?' Kingston shook his head. He was looking at her with some curiosity, for it was interesting to see this high lady in such straits. He had heartily hated her since the execution of his friend Sir Thomas More, who had been one of those beheaded for refusing to acknowledge the act of supremacy, and for whose death he had believed her responsible. Yet in that moment his rancor was unconsciously disarmed by her pallid face, shining white through the dimness, and her trembling effort at self-control. "'No, madam,' he said gruffly, "'to your own lodging, where you lay at your coronation.' A bitter smile parted Anne's lips. "'It is too good for me, is it not?' She murmured with her old sardonic inflection, and she flung back her head and burst into sudden loud laughter. Kingston had opened the door that led from the traitor's entrance to the main portions of the building. She remembered how the last time she had come to the tower the king had met her with a kiss." and she sank now on the stairway that led to her old chambers. "'My coronation! My coronation!' she gasped. "'Oh, my God!' Could there have been a more exquisite torture, a more ironic jest? Oh, thou hast a sense of humor, Master Kingston, or did another devise this for thee? My coronation!' Her laughter grew hysterical. It echoed wildly with a hollow ring through those stone halls. She could not control herself. She rocked to and fro, her whole body quivering with her outbursts of laughter. The strain had been too much for her nerves. The terrible suspense and shock had played upon them like an instrument. My cor— She uttered chokingly, and her laughter stopped. She felt wild sobs bursting in her bosom. 
Unborn tears and cries seemed to be strangling in her throat. She fought them frantically, struggling to regain control. She got to her feet, her limbs still trembling under her, and gave one wild look about that hall which she had seen in such happier circumstances. Ah, wherefore am I here? she whispered. In the same blank way she gazed about her remembered room, and bowed slightly to the four gentlewomen who, with Lady Kingston, were deputed to wait upon her. Then, as the governor of the tower was leaving her, she seemed to rally her wits and called them quickly back. She asked to have the sacrament brought to her prayer closet, and with it upon my lips, she said, I shall protest my innocence of having ever wronged my lord. I am the king's true wedded wife. Mr. Kingston, do you know wherefore I am here? Nay, Kingston told her. When saw you the king? I saw him not since I saw him in the tilt-yard. Mr. Kingston, I pray you tell me where my lord Rockford is. I saw him before dinner in the court, Kingston evaded curtly, and was turning away again. She took a step nearer, his manner inflaming her distrust. Her haggard eyes searched his half-averted face, as if to drag truth from it. When saw you my brother? I saw him last at York Place, was all Kingston would say. An aversion to further scenes, perhaps a wasteful emotion of pity for the Queen, made him shirk the task of enlightening her further. Oh, I hear say that I shall be accused with three men, she flared out, and I can say no more than nay. O oh, Norris, they said that thou had accused me. Thou art here in the tower. Thou and I may die together, and mark thou too art here. Oh, my mother, thou wilt die for sorrow. She checked her outburst and turned sharply upon Kingston again. Mr. Kingston, shall I die without justice? The poorest subject the king hath has that, he replied, and shut the door behind him on the bitter incredulity of her flouting laughter. End of chapter 29of the favor of kings this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the favor of kings by may hastings bradley chapter 30 the tower the disaster which had swept over her, as sudden and blasting as a stroke of lightning, seemed almost too great for her shocked brain to conceive. One day a queen, reigning in the midst of her court, and the next a prisoner in the tower, her life conspired against. Her senses reeled under the staggering horror. She was in a chaos of burning anger, of fear, of terror, and of dazed bewilderment and the attendants who closed in about her had been assigned, not from her friends, but from her enemies. And the two that had been long the most maliciously disposed to her, her aunt, the wife of Sir Edward Boleyn, and Mrs. Cosaines, wife of the master of her horse, carried espionage of her through every hour of the day and night, sleeping on a pallet on the foot of her bed, so that she was forever denied the comfort of privacy and the poor solace of breaking down. And all day long there were five pairs of eyes upon her in a smug satisfaction that marked, God knows what, of petty feminine revenge, and five tongues artfully endeavoring to entangle her into damaging admissions. They pushed insult as far as they dared, parading their disbelief of her innocence with sly headshakes, upraised brows, incredulous smiles, and pertinent innuendos, and Anne, caged and baited, pacing up and down between them in her distracted agony, answered them now with proud silence, now with frantic outpourings of angry denial. Lies, lies, she said fiercely as the aunt, a sister-in-law of Anne's father, a hawk-nosed, mean-mouthed woman, for whom Anne had ever shown a disdainful disregard, repeated an accusation. Lady Boleyn pursed up her lips, and Mrs. Cosaines smiled unbearably. So they are all lies, she murmured. For ten years she had fawned upon Anne, hating her poisonously for her outspoken frankness and reckless pride, 
and now for once she was expanding in the relief of hinting at her true colors. Why, then, on Saturday, did Norris tell thy almoner thou wast a good woman? Why should he not tell my almoner so? Anne demanded passionately. Thou knowest that my enemies for years have tried to fill the court with evil slanders. It is the part of my friends to deny them. I bade Norris to do so, as one who stood close to our person. Very close, came significantly from Lady Boleyn. Anne checked the wild impulse to retort. She remembered that these women were no more malicious than the others of the court, and she read sincerity in the suspicion of their eyes and in the little tossings of their heads. Her whole body burned as she realized their eager belief of these monstrous things. He knew the truth, she said as calmly as she could. He came oft to our rooms, for he is to marry my pretty cousin, Madge Shelton. Methinks he hath been a long time marrying this pretty cousin, Mrs. Cosines insinuated. His wife was long dead. Was it not known to your grace that he was said to come for another's sake? Oh, you have been listening to some jest of Weston's. You know he was ever a gay talker. Anne cried impatiently. It was common flattery for him to say that the suitors of my maids wooed them to be in my presence. Tis the incense offered a queen. Why, you would not take a light jest so hard. It would do great harm to the innocent gentleman. A deep concern throbbed in Anne's voice as she thought of Norris, gay, debonair Norris, whose friendship had never wavered through all her wavering, uncertain years, now in this very tower, in fear of death, for her. Oh, it was pitiful. And as for Smetton, she went on, her voice supplicating in its earnestness to reach these hard old women and win them to belief, why, I have never given him so much as a kind word. He saith the same, surely. T'was not three days ago he was peevish at some command of mine, and I told him he must not look to have me treat him as if he were gentle-born. I know, quoth he, a look sufficeth me. You know the boy had a proud stomach. To arrest him? I could laugh if my heart were not so heavy. But perhaps the king does it but to try me. So Anne's tongue ran, as her thoughts darted hither and yon like lost swallows over the unknown fields of dread. Now defending herself in eager argument and explanation to these women, to whom three days before she would have scorned, to condescend, now railing in passionate resentment and despairing surmise. It was for her brother she feared the most. They will not dare to cage him, she miserably foreboded, and it was with no cry of surprise that she learned at last that Roqueford was in the tower and had been there since noon of the day that she had been brought there. She could not discover that anything was charged against him except complicity with her supposed misdeeds. Presently she was informed that Braverton, Wyatt, Weston, and Page had been added to the prisoners. So many, she said with a melancholy smile, must so many be destroyed? In these arrests was revealed the scope of the action against her, the inclusive sweep of that scythe which was mowing her down. None of her faction who would have hindered or avenged her death were to be left. Her brother and all his intimates were entangled. Some extra charges had evidently been trumped up to include them all. Wyatt, she feared, would be made that third alleged lover at whom the council had hinted. From her experience she was sure that threats and menaces were being used to intimidate those friends still at large. Of her father's fate she remained in ignorance. Once she thought she heard his voice in the halls. Kingston denied it, but that was not conclusive. The commissioners did not visit her further. Kingston shirked talking to her, leaving her to his wife who hustled about the royal apartments in complacent importance. Anne had absolutely no word of what was being prepared against her, nor of what she might expect from one hour to another. Her greatest terror was of some mockery of a trial behind the barred doors from which no syllable of her defense would penetrate to the world without. She lived in that terror from one hideous minute to another, starting at every opening of the door. She did not unlock her lips on her anguish now. 
she began to perceive that these women had been put there about her to report and twist her every word into some damaging admission to create evidence that they were only too ready to manufacture from her least reference she tried to hide her grief from their hateful eyes with a desperate effort at composure but as she lay on her cot at night with lady boleyn and mrs cosaines sleeping away at the foot of it her tears fell silently hour after hour into the pillow not the hot passionate drops of rebellion but those cold slow tears of hopeless misery which despair alone wrings from a breaking heart she was on her knees in the relaxing privacy of her prayer closet her lips moving in an urgent plea to the god of justice to come to her aid when lady kingston entered to announce that there was some one in the outer chamber who would speak with her upon the king's business what name said anne rising in eagerness with a rush of hope the name was a knell sir nicholas carew i will be with him in a moment she paused nerving herself to the evil she foreboded in this arrival her vanity strengthened her she shook out her gown brushing up her hair and summoning a smile she swept into the outer room nothing in her life had been so stinging to her pride as it was now to face the triumphant gleam under carew's insolent lids and that mocking sneer on his thin lips he bowed to her with an exaggerated deference and murmured in tones of assumed commiseration i fear i interrupt your majesty's devotions oh i am not in such great need thereof as some wherewith i am acquainted anne quickly retorted her pulses were beating faster as she faced him her blood sang its old reckless song of hearty defiance. "'Tis well to say them ere it is too late,' was his gentle reminder. "'A ripe thought for yourself to dwell upon,' her prompt rejoinder came. "'But one whereof I have not so much need as some wherewith I speak,' he taunted. "'You have grown nimble of wit, a great change from your former habit. "'There have been many changes since your day, cousin.' He paused, and with a look he reminded Lady Kingston of his former request for privacy, and she withdrew with the four ladies in her train. Sir Nicholas sauntered to the door behind her, closed it carefully, listening to the retreating footsteps, and then returned to Anne, jauntily smiling. He was dressed as for a fete. "'Your errand, sir,' she reminded him. "'Do you indeed come from the king?' "'I do indeed come from the king.' and he doth indeed commend himself to you, and he bids you, by my word of mouth, redeem yourself from this grievous situation in which you now find yourself to the great confusion of his grace's hope and the scandal of the whole realm. Carew delivered himself of the harangue in a sing-song nasal manner, his glittering eyes mocking her, that sinister smile still curling his lips. And how am I to redeem myself? He biddeth thee confess the truth. Thou hast nothing to gain by denial. All is known and ascertained, if not all. And the smile deepened, at least enough to part that fair head of yours from your neck. Denial, I say, therefore, is in vain, and but bringeth public shame. The king is well advised of your doings. And yet such is his extraordinary mercy and clemency that he is minded to save your life and shield you from the consequences of your own acts, if you will but be open and own the truth. He biddeth you to confess. And if I confess this truth, then will my life be most certainly spared? It will be spared. How may that be, if I should confess to being the vile woman that my accusers declare? All things are possible to his grace's mercy. He will be kind, so you do not anger him by denial. And my life will be spared, Anne repeated. Why then, Nicholas, I am indeed safe, for I will straightway confess that very truth which he seeks to know. And the truth is, that I am innocent in the sight of God and man of these infamous charges that have been laid upon me, that never have I been unfaithful to him in word or act, and that those poor gentlemen who are now imprisoned are not the ones who ever solicited me to betray my wifely honor. 
Her tone was barbed with peculiar meaning. Carew gave a thin laugh. This, then, is the truth which thou mayest bear back to him. The truth, hear you, whereunto I will stake my soul with the sacrament upon my lips. I am innocent, and so I have told the truth, and I have his princely promise to spare my life. The truth, jeered Carew. Thou art a lying fool to persist in this defiance. I have told you all is discovered. Norris and Weston. Of what can Weston be accused? Of what indeed? He is tarred with the same brush. Ah, you are touched. Anne repressed her bitter surprise. I know well, she declared, that Norris and Weston are proclaiming their innocence and mine. Thy musician hath already confessed. Confessed? To what? I thought that would prick you. Why, to— You know the word, dear cousin. The seventh commandment is framed to forbid it. He hath confessed, Anne repeated. Ay, fully. Dates and places. Lord, he hath been three times a sinner, I am told. Mark Smetton. Anne's tone was a blaze of contempt. You mean that he has been threatened for fear of his life to do this vile thing? Or else tortured? Ah, as she saw from the gleam in Carew's face that she had struck the mark, he hath been tortured. Belike, Carew indifferently gave back. A knotted rope tightened about the head works wonders in greasing the tongue. The rack, too, performeth miracles. A pity they do not employ it in another case. He gave her a terrible and evil look that showed the ceaseless fire burning under the man's assumption of sneering ease. A knotted rope, the rack, Anne repeated wildly. Why, the poor little fool, he hath a horror of pain. And so he confessed. Why, so did that Sebastiano Montecuculli confess that he had poisoned the Dauphin of France, and it was afterwards found that the Dauphin had not been poisoned at all. No one believes what the rack rings out. Believe it or not, grinned Carew, it is enough to sign death warrants on. You see how lies the land. He hath confessed. Mayhap the others will follow. They may have done so already, for aught I know, or care. My business is with yourself. Will you own the truth? Why, I have done so. You dare not feign to disbelieve me. And so you are innocent? I am innocent indeed. You lie, came violently from him. You lie, you jade, you... He heaped vile epithets upon her, his passion leaping its barriers. You, innocent, I, so was Mary Magdalene, so was Cleopatra pure. Why, the most defiled outcast that walks these streets of London is clean compared to your besotted filth. You have been steeped in sinning over head and ears. He approached her threateningly, the smile gone, his lips drawn back over his teeth as the wild beast within him raged out at her. She did not shrink from him. She met his glare with that old mockery of look, that amused glint of contempt that had always been her keenest weapon against his fury. Well, if I have sinned, you have at least this comfort, she tossed carelessly at him, in a voice grown suddenly cool and sweet, that it hath never been with you, dear Nicholas. The sharpness of that thrust the unquenched flame of the spirit in the woman he had come to crush caught Carew strangely off his guard. Thank God, was all he could find to say, for a moment, as he groped for words, keen, annihilating words, that would beat down and dominate her arrogance. He tried to choke back the signs of the rage that overmastered him. It would have been safer for you, he got out with grim significance. Her eyes traveled slowly, thoughtfully, the length of his figure, and came to rest again on his passion-scarred face. Truly, she owned. Letting a soft, regretful sigh escape, it would have been the safer. No one would ever suspect me of taking such a lover. But it would have been a hard price for safety. And her flouting laughter burst out at him. He flung her a venomous look and turned to the door. Laugh on, he jeered. You have not so long a time to hear that voice of thine. No? It is to be silenced, then? 
and to think it will have to go without having once said any of those sweet things you have so urged on it to say. Never once a yes for me, dear Nicholas. Never aught but floutings. It is very sad, is it not? By God, he choked out, I'd like to behead you with these hands. Fie! I would ne'er let you as near me as that. She was facing him with her hands clasped negligently behind her head. Her beautiful figure was drawn up to its full height. It was a pose of insolent, studied disdain. An unconquerable mockery curled her lips and glowed in the bright darkness of her eyes. She had forgotten the fears of life and death. She was answering with oblivious passion to the one demand upon her for courage and contempt. It was superb. A bitter admiration stabbed Carew as he saw that even in that hour of his triumph her spirit was as unsurrendered to him as that body he had so long coveted. He suffered, and he suffered with an anguish compounded of all the venom of his nature. He could gloat ghoulishly upon her danger. He had plotted and connived at her death, but he had never wanted her as now when she was escaping him for ever. End of chapter 30《Chapter Thirty One of The Favor of Kings》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Favor of Kings by Mary Hastings Bradley. Chapter Thirty One A Letter and Two Songs. The Chamber of State was in darkness save for the candles on the table where anne sat writing in the shadow hidden pallet at the foot of the immense bed her two jailers had fallen into slumber and their heavy breathing was the only sound in the room except the occasional scratching drive of anne's quill the letter was to her husband she wrote your grace's anger and my imprisonment are things so strange unto me as what to write or what to excuse, I am altogether ignorant. Whereas you sent unto me, willing me to confess a truth, and so obtain favor, by such an one as you know to be mine ancient, professed enemy. I no sooner received this message by him, than I rightly conceived your meaning. And if, as you say, confessing a truth may indeed procure my safety, I shall with all willingness and duty perform your command. But let not your grace ever imagine that your poor wife will ever be brought to acknowledge a fault, where not so much as a thought thereof proceeded. And, to speak a truth, never prince had wife more loyal in all duty, and in all true affection, than you ever found in Anne Boleyn, with which name and place I could willingly have contented myself, if God and your grace's pleasure had been so pleased neither did i at any time so far forget myself in my exultation or received queenship but that i always looked for such an alteration as now i find for the ground of my preferment being on no surer foundation than your grace's fancy the least alteration i knew was well and sufficient to draw that fancy to some other subject you have chosen me from a low estate to be your queen and companion far beyond my desert or desire if then you found me worthy of such honour good your grace let not any light fancy or bad counsel of my enemies withdraw your princely favour from me neither let that stain that unworthy stain of a disloyal heart toward your good grace ever cast so foul a blot on your most dutiful wife and the infant princess your daughter Try me, good king, but let me have a lawful trial, and let not my sworn enemies sit as my accusers and judges. Yes, let me receive an open trial for my truth, shall fear no open shame. Then shall you see, either mine innocency cleared, your suspicion and conscience satisfied, the ignominy and slander of the world stopped, or my guilt openly declared, so that whatsoever God or you may determine of me, your grace may be freed from an open censure, 
and mine offence being lawfully proved your grace is at liberty both before god and man not only to execute worthy punishment on me as an unlawful wife but to follow your affection already settled for that party for whose sake i now am as i am whose name i could some good while since have pointed unto your grace being not ignorant of my suspicion therein she paused her breast rising and falling with the passionate breath then her eyes shining with undaunted courage she went on but if you have already determined of me and that not only my death but an infamous slander must bring you the enjoying of your desired happiness then i desire of god that he will pardon your great sin therein and likewise mine enemies the instruments thereof and that he will not call you to a strict account for your unprincely and cruel usage of me at his general judgment seat where both you and myself must shortly appear and in whose judgment i doubt not whatever the world may think of me mine innocence shall be openly known and sufficiently cleared again she paused and the light died out of her eyes and they filled with a look of unutterable pain her hand trembled on this last paragraph my last and only request shall be that myself may only bear the burden of your grace's displeasure and that it may not touch the innocent souls of those poor gentlemen who as i understand are likewise in straight imprisonment for my sake if ever i have found favour in your sight if ever the name of anne boleyn hath been pleasing in your ears then let me obtain this request and I will so leave not to trouble your grace any further, with mine earnest prayers to the Trinity to have your grace in his good keeping, and to direct you in all your actions. Your most loving and ever faithful wife, Anne Boleyn, from my doleful prison in the tower, this sixth of May. The quill slipped from her fingers, and she sat silent in bitter meditation, slowly she grew aware of the plaintive strains of a lute that were floating softly down to her through the night air from some open window she knew the melody and wyatt's manner of playing and her thoughts went pitifully up to him as he played there in the dark she felt a sudden wistful craving to see him to speak to him and say those kind things which she had never said she stole to the window and knelt there resting her cheek on the cold ledge as she listened he had composed that very melody for some verses that he had written her and she repeated them silently to herself now as the sad cadences sank about her my lute awake perform the last labor that thou and i shall waste the end that i have now begun for when this song is said and past my lute be still for i have done the candles flickered and went out as she knelt there sad beyond all words and yet faintly comforted by that sweet music falling from one whose thoughts must be of her suddenly the delicate strains were lost in a noisy outbreak of song from directly beneath her window and rising she looked down on a chain of gaily lighted barges moving over the dark surface of the river filled with hilarious revellers she pressed her face against the bars trying to distinguish the figures in the flare of the torches through the music she heard loud voices and roistering shouts from one barge to another drink drink the canakin clink lady boleyn and mrs cosins roused rest you ladies said anne stepping back from the window with a smile lost to them in the darkness of the room tis but the king returning from his revels although she lay awake a long time listening the lute did not sound again just so she thought had the king's din drowned out wyatt's delicate strains in her life then she thought of the letter that she had penned to that oblivious reveller beneath her window and a desolation too deep for tears possessed her if ever the name of anne boleyn had been pleasing to his ears one wife he had given over to indignity and isolation and now another he flung to shame and death one noon she learned that wyatt and sir richard page had been released a flash of hope shot through her only to be succeeded by an increased despair as she realized that this sorting out of the innocent from the guilty made her brother's position and that of his companions more desperate 
evidently they were retained as guilty but of what were they accusing george complicity in all this supposed wrongdoing she concluded but she was profoundly grateful for wyatt's escape she had been afraid that his past intimacy with her might entangle him though he had absented himself from court for so many years now that it would appear difficult to connect their names she surmised that page's powerful relations the fitzwilliams and russells had secured his immunity it is useless to record the terrible gusts of anger that shook her as the hours went by cooped there in that room with those spying women she paced up and down up and down forgetting sometimes those spies about her in the driving extremity of her impotent rage she knew a wrath that she had never known before she had thought she was in straits before thought she was helpless pitiable but this this was helplessness and misery such as her darkest thought had never fathomed not to be able to lift one finger in her own defence not to be able to aid her brother he and elizabeth were the two dearest beings on earth to her and one lay under fear of death and the other what would be elizabeth's fate if the mother were taken from her who would fight for her while well, parliament had decreed that she was the next heir it would take some time even if her mother were done away with to go back from all that and henry's stubbornness would dislike to undo what he had so persistently laboured to effect his stubbornness was probably the reason why he had not ridded himself of anne by the more simple expediency of divorce there would have been small opposition in her case she had no emperor uncle to menace on her behalf and then she caught her breath as she remembered that agreement of the powers that no woman would be recognized as henry's wife during her own lifetime and jane would fear her living of course she must die and as no one was more adept at such manners than cromwell the able secretary had come into favor again by devising this method of relief for his master why it was as simple as sighing and yet it could not be there must be some way out perhaps her father but the days went by full of dragging hours yet too swift after all in passing and no ray of light appeared yet however anne's reason might array these powerful facts against her and admit the extreme improbability of any chance of escape however she might say to herself that she expected nothing but the worst hope lived unquenched in every drop of her blood reason had nothing to do with it it was simply incredible that she should die she was so alive these disasters happened to other people to old men to others but never to young women of scarce twenty-nine so quick with life two weeks had almost dragged out their course and then one morning anne's feverishly alert hearing caught the distant sounds of bustle and the clanging of heavy doors she listened her heart seeming to stop beating but the steps did not approach and the sounds died away from lady kingston she learned that norris and brereton and weston and smeaton had gone to westminster to their trial and i and my brother to-morrow end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of the favor of kings this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the favor of kings by may hastings bradley chapter thirty two the trial to avoid the crowds that would block the streets to see the queen taken to her trial it was determined to have the case heard in the hall of the tower itself seats and platforms and barriers were hastily erected during the night and by morning it was the morning of the fifteenth of may the peers who were to sit on the jury commenced to arrive but early as they came they found the way blocked by a huge concourse of people that had been gathering solidly during the hours before dawn the green enclosure within the walls was densely packed with those who had fought their way into the foremost ranks while without the entrance wedged with humanity a mob of all sorts and conditions of men and women struggled and pushed to advance within 
Excitement had run riot in London since the Queen's arrest and the condemnation of the four commoners, three days before, had stirred it to deeper intensity. For the first time, the exact accusations had been made public, and while it would not have been hard for a scandal-breathing populace to accept the story of Anne's guilt, in moderation, the very thickness of the mud that was plastered on, the lack of any evidence but hearsay, and the confession of a tortured boy, the dauntless and unswerving denial of the three young gentlemen, produced its inevitable effect. And more potent still were the rumors of Henry's new wedding clothes that were under way. How very pat Anne's guilt was falling for him, quite as pat as a scruple of conscience that had pricked him some ten years previous. And the London people who had sided against Anne in that first question of conscience rallied about her now, helplessly indignant and pitiful. And so there were low mutterings in the crowd that surged and pressed against the doors, and many black looks at the peers who passed within to their work of judgment. Within the hall the peers had assembled upon the platform built for them, a curiously constrained body of men who, in general, appeared to avoid each other's glances and were at some pains to assume an elaborate appearance of ease. But here and there were eyes alight with malice or revenge. Suffolk smiled continually, an arrogant, cruel smile that foretasted triumph. Near him sat Anne's father, very quiet and contained at the first glance, but the second found something subtly aged and shrunken beneath the suave exterior. Heaven knows the thoughts that filled that secret and calculating mind, as he sat there with eyes fixed and diverted from the furtive, wondering glances of his neighbors. It would be strange indeed if no agitation at the fate of his son and daughter invaded his anxious speculations as to his standing with the new regime. When the trumpets sounded, announcing with ironic pomp that Anne, Queen of England, was entering the court, Wilshire's gaze dropped to the floor. He did not raise it for some time. Anne came between Sir William Kingston and Sir Edward Walsingham, with Lady Kingston and Lady Boleyn following after. She walked slowly, with high, held head, a little pale, but with a mien as serene and undisturbed as if she were going to some great honor. So the courtiers whispered. With a condescending graciousness she bowed to the jury of peers, and her eyes lingered quietly for a moment on the face of her uncle, the high steward, in his raised chair beneath a canopy of state, and cold and vindictive as the small man was, he did not meet her glance, but stooped and began whispering to Lord Chancellor Audley, who sat beside him and who had presided over the trial of the commoners on the twelfth. On the other side sat Sir John Allen, the Lord Mayor, visibly uneasy and perturbed, who had attended at the King's request with a deputation of aldermen, wardens, and members of the principal crafts of London. Behind the barriers crowded members of the court and any others who had obtained entrance. Anne seated herself in the armchair provided for her, arranging her heavy, ermine-bordered robes with careful attention. The hum of tongues that had lowered at her entrance sprang up again louder than ever, and she raised her head to meet the curious eyes upon her with the composure that came from the tensity of her pride and courage. Her mind had never been more clearly alert and vigorous, hopeless as she could not but know any defense of hers to be before those men who had assembled to fulfill the formalities of sentencing her to death. Every vestige of spirit in her was resolved upon fighting to the last. The whispered conferences and murmurings ceased as Sir Christopher Hale, the King's attorney, rose to commence the argument on behalf of the Crown. He was a man of fine presence and fine voice, capable of manly strength of utterance and of expressing a most varied range of feeling. Anne remembered as she listened now intently to him, for this was the first knowledge she had of the accusations against her. How she had once said he could let his voice tremble and sob over his phrases while he was wondering what he would have for dinner. He was putting the whole of his eloquence now into the case, denouncing, with telling emphasis, this woman whom the king had loved and believed in, whom he had raised from her low estate to the sharer of his throne and the mother of his child, 
and how after he had heaped honour after honour upon her she had betrayed his faith and the faith of england so indissolubly bound up in the person of its sovereigns and had plunged into such vicious excesses that language itself halted in the description thereupon his language flowed steadily on the queen he declared had solicited and corrupted three of the gentlemen of the king's court men about his person whom he had trusted as his brothers and another a favorite musician of the court and she had held repeated criminal intercourse with her brother lord rockford a shock went through anne as she heard that infamous charge her body trembled slightly and then she held herself still hale was going on and on there was no depth he solemnly declared to her depravity she had conspired to bring about the king's death agreeing to marry one of her lovers afterwards she had given a locket to norris in a conspiracy to have the late princess dowager catherine poisoned and her daughter the lady mary also she had spoken contemptuously of the king of his literary productions and of the way he dressed showing clearly that she was altogether tired of him cromwell seconded the efforts of hale he was not so eloquent a speaker but there was terrific insistency in his address and all the time anne listened intently noting each point and framing each refutation while all the while it seemed to her so bizarre and unreal that she was sitting here on trial for her life against such charges nothing in her whole experience had ever seemed so strange and dreamlike as her presence here in this dark stone chamber her jailers at her side the voice of her accusers thundering about her and those rows of hostile faces before her her mind told her that there was no hope no faintest dawn of it but this message of her mind was ineffectual and meaningless to the vivid life that coursed through her veins die and under such vile charges every drop of blood and every whit of spirit in her were in brave allegiance to defeat this wretched conspiracy and when she rose to meet her accusers she had never in her life been more intensely collected more alertly on her guard before she spoke she let her glance pass for the first time about the throng of onlookers at the other end of the hall meeting for the briefest second the eyes that were gazing up at her with such widely ranging expressions she felt she saw her stepmother's tear-swollen face under a heavy veil and next her the old dowager duchess shrunken and pale like a figure of ivory and then she saw lady exeter and the duchess of norfolk and lady carew alight with bitter revenge face after face of the women and men with whom she had jested and made merry through the long years of her ascendancy and again the feeling of the strangeness of her presence here and of the nightmarish quality of the whole thing gripped her intensely. Then she turned toward the peers. I hardly know, she said, speaking in a quiet voice that penetrated with its peculiar singing quality to the farthest corner of the hushed hall, whether to begin this, my defense, with those charges of my unwifely criticism of the king's literary productions or of the conspiracy to poison the Lady Mary ye have amassed so much of accusation these things are so strange to me that i scarce know how to speak of them but she paused and her look passed slowly from man to man of that jury i do declare my absolute innocence of each and every one of all these infamous charges i have never exchanged a word or a deed of love with any man save my husband my liege lord the king Cromwell was on his feet instantly. Do you deny, madam, that you have given a locket to Henry Norris and certain money to Sir Francis Weston? I cannot, and I do not, she replied with spirit. There is no evil in that doing. I would have given you a locket if I had deemed you worthy of such a token from your queen. It was given openly as a token of royal pleasure, and you can no more construe into that blameless act a shred of love or a plot to poison my husband the king or the king's daughter then i can construe a pair of gloves i once gave you my lord into a plot to murder my mother the world knows this you but bring such childish trifles as evidence against me here because there is none other evidence that you can bring 
You have said unto me that I did play the sinner when my infant daughter, the Princess Elizabeth, was not a month in age. Why, you know yourselves, those that were in the court then, that I was scarce upon my feet at that time, and that but for the day of her christening I never left my room nor the society of my ladies. Again Cromwell's voice thundered at her. Where were you then, madam, on this night, the sixth of October, which Mark Smeton hath sworn on his oath was one when he had meeting with you? The sixth of October? Master Cromwell, that is over seven months ago, and I do protest that my memory cannot now without thought recall whether I slept or read or played. Nor I do believe is there one among you, and she faced the jury, nor you yourself, Sir Secretary, who can name off hand being taken so unawares how any certain night, seven months gone by, was passed, unless that night be some sort of special occasion to him, as this night ye name was not but I do vow that it was spent in the society of my ladies, in womanly and modest undertakings, nor did any moment of it afford displeasure to my lord the king. And as for the oath of Mark Smeton, wrung from him on the rack, my lords, what credence is there in that? Will you not give heed to the stout protests of those three good gentlemen, who even under the offer of pardon would not admit so infamous a slander to themselves and to their queen, the word of three gentlemen, my lords, against— But the confession of one criminal, boomed Hale's fine voice. One witness is not enough, sirs, to convict a person of high treason, she gave back. In your case it is sufficient, spoke Cromwell with sharp emphasis. Nay, but there you speak the truth, she flashed. Any hearsay, any witness, however untrustworthy, will do to condemn me. But I put it to you, sirs on your conscience as Christian gentlemen and knights of honor, to consider whether the tortured oath of a low-born lad can stand against the declaration of these gentlemen, who have refused, even under promise of their lives, to confess so vile a lie. That these gentlemen came off into our rooms cannot be denied, nor have I thought to do so. It were strange that a queen were neglected at the court. And that they are my particular friends is indeed the truth. Being the intimates of my good lord, I did naturally honor them. That is why they have been singled out for to lend the color and semblance of truth to this vile aspersion. What others, then, my friends would serve? But I have never seen these gentlemen save in the presence of my ladies, nor have I been advised of the nature of these accusations and the charges that ye confront me now with, nor allowed to procure my witnesses to confirm the honesty of my words, and to account for each questioned hour. As to my relations with my brother, what you say as evidence is that once he was alone with me for a considerable time, and that I have always given signs of fondness to him. I ask you, my lords, when has it ever been the custom in England that a brother may not spend time with his sister, nor remain in the room together? I have ne'er heard denial of the goodness of such usage either here or in foreign countries. It hath always been held right and sweet for brother and sister to love one another. Is there a wife of yours who hath not at some hour been alone with her own brother? Is she then a sinner? Ye see what child's talk this is. And as to those accusations ye have read out of unsigned letters, handed in to those juries by those my enemies, who would under the dark shield of namelessness have thrust these lying daggers at me, why, I will but ask you, sirs, what credence you dare place in such unsigned and unsupported statements. Tis for you to disprove, madam, not for these lawful accusers to support, the king's attorney reminded her sternly. My lawful accusers! Anne's eyes were a blaze of contempt. Her voice did not raise its pitch, but it rang with redoubled intensity. They are lies, pure and simple, handed in by enemies vowed to my destruction. Never in my life have I said those false things that are written here. I deny that I have e'er spoken contemptuously of my lord the king, or of his writings, and I ask you to confront me here face to face with those that dare say otherwise. And I ask of you, my lord, to bring before me, according to English law, that Mark Smeton, this confessor who hath spoken such infamy of me, to my face he dare not repeat it. 
That appeared to be also the opinion of the court, for after a brief instant's interrogation, her plea was denied. At this she blanched a trifle, understanding in such injustice the absolute determination of her death. "'And ye call this English justice,' she said. "'My lords, even a peasant woman would not be so cruelly handled. "'But I am not here to rail at you, but to make manifest my absolute innocency. "'Ye have said that a certain locket, given to Henry Norris, "'was in token of a conspiracy to poison his grace, my husband. "'This locket was given in last November, 1535, I ask you to turn back your minds to the then condition of my affairs and of the affairs of England at that time. My predecessor, the Princess Dowager, was in excellent health. I held a contested throne by virtue of my lord and king's protection. Were his strong support once removed, what would have been my condition? As pitiable, my lords, as today I find it, when the malice of mine avowed enemies has turned that support from me. With the king gone, you wot well that there would have been that instant uprising in favor of Catherine and her daughter, which her supporters have endeavored unceasingly to bring about with the king alive. I would have been able to offer but scant resistance. Master Cromwell would have turned against me. Master Kingston, and she glanced for a moment at the man, whom I do know for a loyal friend to that deceased lady, would have shut the doors of that fortress, the tower, in my face and the jailers of Kimbolton and Hatfield would have been the first to try and obtain forgiveness by raising the banner of Catherine and of Mary. I would have had all Spain and all the Holy See against me, and more than half, I fear, of England. Would I have dared to hope that I could reign alone upon that throne to which the kindness of my Lord hath raised me? Such a rash and presumptuous thought hath never visited my breast." I ask you to consider these things truly, my lords. Weigh them well, and you will see how baseless and of what light credence are these slanders of my enemies. And at that time, when you have said I was conspiring against my husband, know you not I was hoping to have a son to my husband? If which thing had happened I would have been the safest wife in England, and the happiest of women, as was indeed my motto upon a time not so long past. At that day I was deemed worthy of the crown of England, and I say unto you, good my lords, that I have never betrayed that trust, but have striven to fulfill my duties, that I might appear before my lord husband on earth, and God our judge in the world to come, with a conscience innocent of all offense. That I have been given to laughter and mirth hath perchance yielded cause for this malice of mine enemies, now manifest to find an entrance." I deemed myself above all suspicion or reproach. So sure was I of mine own faithfulness and integrity towards the trust that had been reposed in me. Nay, hear me, she uttered, in imperious command, as Cromwell made a motion to interrupt. This is the truth, and from it I will not depart though my body should be torn in pieces. I am innocent of all you have accused me, and I stand before you the most foully wronged lady in the domain. I ask you to consider on what light babble these accusations rest. I have given a locket to Norris, and therefore you say I have conspired the king's death. I have shown you how little reason, aside from the grief of my true love and duty to my prince, I would have to rejoice in that death. I have been alone with my brother, who is a dear brother to me, and whom I love as a sister. Therefore we have been wrongdoers. And I say unto you that all this slander, this talk of evil doing, of conspiring against the king, of making sport of his person and his works, hath all arisen in the minds of my sworn enemies, whom ye dare not confront me with, and that not a syllable thereof hath proceeded from us. As to having tried to poison the Lady Mary, God knows I have made many proffers of friendship, and it is not my fault but the fault of those who have ill-advised and inflamed her mind that we are not in accord as mother and daughter this day. As to that other charge, that this discovery, as you name it, of my ill-doing hath grieved the king's majesty, and brought his health into sad danger, I cannot think that you are serious in this, nor will any credit your words who have heard the music and the merrymaking that have sounded from the king's barge, as his grace hath passed on the river these many nights of my strange imprisonment. 
At that a hum of voices sounded from the back of the hall, a swelling undertone of agreement. Few among that crowd but had heard those sounds of revelry. Few were unacquainted with the tales of the king's latest infatuation, and the tide of popular feeling, so long against Anne, the usurper, the second queen, surged now in helpless sympathy to the woman who stood there, unfriended and unflinching, in the most gallant fight that ever championed a lost cause. Hale was quickly on his feet, but Anne made a denying gesture toward him, and took a step nearer the peers. "'My lords, I have answered all that which you have accused me,' she said slowly. "'You have given me no time to prepare defense, have denied me counsel and witnesses, and I was not sure indeed of what you were accounting me guilty until I was brought hither. But I have answered you out of the mouth of innocence, and so I rest my case. God, he knoweth all hearts. He knoweth that I speak the truth. I take him for my witness that I am innocent of all that ye have accused me. There was a long silence when that clear voice ceased, and then the hum of undertones swelled again about the hall. Anne took one quick look out over those crowding faces, and then her steady eyes rested on the faces of the peers turned somewhat uncertainly towards each other. She read in those frowning and calculating looks what they had come there to do. She saw Cromwell sitting quietly and gazing at her, if he had been perturbed, bustling about, but no, he sat there unalarmed and lost himself in that strange absorption. It was as if he saw her in a new and blinding light, and she read a frank and curious admiration on the man's hard and cruel face. She saw the Lord Mayor shaking his head with sadness, that honest Lord Mayor who afterwards blurted forth that he could observe nothing in the proceedings against her, but that they were resolved to be rid of her, and then her keen eyes turned again to that dreadful jury. Her uncle drew on the black cap. Anne rose to receive her sentence. Not even those nearest her could detect the quiver of the features when she heard pronounced that Anne, Queen of England, had been found guilty of high treason, and was to be beheaded or burned at the king's pleasure. Very quietly she asked leave to say a few words. I am ready for death. My innocence doth not fear it, she said in unfaltering clearness. But what doth grieve me sadly is that those poor gentlemen, who are innocent of all that is charged to them, should suffer on my account. I ask a short time to be prepared for death. One of the peers rose uncertainly to his feet, and moved towards the door. It was Percy of Northumberland, and Anne, for the first time taking note of his presence there, thought numbly how strange it was among all this strangeness that he should be sitting in judgment upon her. Ten years ago, a girl of nineteen, she had cried her heart out for him. Well, she had Wolsey to thank for that. And Catherine, those two old enemies whom she was so shortly to join, at the door Percy turned back on her a strange look. She had met his eyes many times at court, but always between them had been that screen of artificiality. Now there was something poignant and awful in his revealing gaze. She had heard that he was ill, slowly dying of some nervous disorder. She gave him a faint smile, and in that moment she remembered what her lips had long forgotten. The first touch of his mouth on hers. Well, she was soon to receive the kisses of another lover, that cold and ultimate possessor, death. These thoughts all flashed through her mind like one thought. Then she saw that her jailers had resumed their positions at her side to re-escort her to the tower. Just at the doorway she passed George being brought in for his trial, and the eyes of brother and sister met in a swift, deep look. He was erect, smiling, disdainful. He had not one trace of hope now, and insouciant defiance was painted on his debonair features. The jig was up, his smile seemed ironically to say. They had never been so completely united as in that final and speechless second. Anne's heart went out to him in a surge of tenderness and pride. She smiled as she left the room. End of chapter 32、Chapter、33 of The Favor of Kings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Favor of Kings by May Hastings Bradley Chapter 33 The Numbered Hours Death Anne repeated it over and over to herself as she sat at her casement that night overlooking the Thames. She could not sleep, but a sense of fatigue after the storm of the day had laid hold of her and she felt inert and unwilling to move. Her tired body seemed a cage to her throbbing mind. In the next room slept Mary Wyatt and Helen and Madge and Amy, for she had been granted the company of her own maids, now there was no longer the necessity for putting spies about her person. Death. Anne sat there trying to prepare her mind for that stupendous event, as she had requested time to do, and all the while she was thinking how fantastic and unreal it all was. A night wind from the north was blowing, and she heard beneath her the swishing of little waves against the grey stones of her prison, and breathed the warm, languorous smell of reedy river waters. It brought to her mind the remembrance of the days she had spent upon that river, of exquisite green shores, where the trees hung breathless over their still reflections, and of deep emerald pools where the silver fish poised in their swift flights. With an impatient effort she wrenched her wayward mind from these futile wanderings to fix it on that thought of death. She could not realize that thought, but it was coming to her. She repeated, death on a scaffold. For she had been told that owing to the king's leniency her sentence would not be the stake. She would be beheaded. She put her hand to her neck as if to assure herself of the fact. There was where the sword would fall. She tried to visualize the scene. She saw herself mounting the scaffold. She saw the black-clad executioner and the worn and blood-stained block where she must kneel. But even such dire images did not make that scene real to her, but it appeared like part of another's life on which she, Anne Boleyn, was gazing. She thought of the beyond, the unknown born to which that final moment on the scaffold would send her journeying. She had always had faith in a hereafter, or rather she had assumed that she had, in that unquestioning and literal acceptance which youth gives to those shadowy affairs of so distant a date. But now death was actually upon her, and after death, what? If death should be all, the thought of the absolute cessation of the human spirit roused in her an incredulous and passionate denial. It could not be all. It could not. Of what avail was life, its strivings, its griefs and sufferings, if death ended all, like a huge snuffer over a flickering candle? Did such wrongs as hers descend into the grave with the poor body, to be covered by the earth, unredressed by any higher judgment? Did such dissolute monsters as Henry caper through their satyr lives to sleep in an eternal peace? It could not be. Her desperate need of higher justice compelled its own belief. She felt that life without this ultimate summing up was chaos unthinkable. Surely God would requite her for all she had suffered here, would reveal her innocence, would confound her enemies. Her stricken heart dwelt on that thought. At his throne, all would be made clear. She roused from the passionate comfort of that thought to remind herself that there was yet much to do to prepare herself. She must make ready her soul and repent of those matters that needed repentance. She tried to turn her thoughts back through her years and search them with remorseless clearness, but her thoughts evaded her and slipped into straying bypaths of her own. Disconnected visions passed hazily through her mind, in fitful waywardness. She saw good Madame Simonette, her governess, crying at the foot of a tree she had rashly scaled. She saw herself trying on her coronation robes, and the dazzling white and scarlet of the image that laughed back at her from her glass. She remembered the first touch of her baby's hand on her breast, and with that memory came the only pang of fear that assailed her. Her baby. Elizabeth. 
In what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. She heard it as if it had been spoken, and she thought of the day she had surprised Henry and Jane. Then she thought of the Lady Mary. Aye, she had done wrong there. The girl had driven her to bitterness with her disdainful pipe of the king's mistress. But would she not have done the same? Would she not have had her own daughter do the same? There was something fine in that haughty and unintimidated Spanish blood to which Anne had yielded secret admiration through her spite. And now a sad and helpless remorse possessed her at the irritation and bitterness she had extended upon the dispossessed little princess, a remorse that was quickened by a terrified foreboding of the retaliation upon her own child. Oh, she had sinned there. But let it not be visited upon Elizabeth, her innocent baby. Let her bear it all. Surely, in the agony of this ignoble death, she was bearing it all. But fear had touched her, and she began to pray feverishly, pleading with heaven to save her baby from the anger of her elder sister and her enemies. Then she prayed for her brother, for the courage and comfort of his soul. She wondered how he was passing the night, and if she could get permission to see him on the morrow for the last time. The last time. She covered her face with her hands, but she could not weep. She remembered her brother as she had seen him that day, erect and proud, meeting his fate with dauntless scorn. She had heard that he had defended himself so well that the betting had been ten to one for his acquittal. It was a losing wager, for Cromwell intended none of that faction to escape. He himself was to marry Jane Seymour's sister. For a few moments her thoughts went back, almost wonderingly, to the man who had undone her, and she had never really feared him. Now he loomed before her as a monster, subtle, shrewd, unscrupulous, a cunning, wary spider weaving, weaving with his round, bright eyes, darting in incessant watch over his precious interests. Her downfall had been a fine stroke for him. He had by the same blow removed the woman who was blocking his imperial policy, and cleared the path for the king's new favorite, which was also the path of his own personal interests. Anne thought of Jane and wondered at the tides of hope and vanity and ambition that must have flooded that narrow breast. What thoughts were locked behind the unrevealing features of that woman who had helped attire her on that fatal May day? Then her thoughts came back to her brother again. It seemed to her, if she could only see him, could only cast herself upon his neck, that this stone in her side would melt and she could weep again. Their tears would mingle as in childhood. Was he alone now in this dark hour of his despair, or had he the sad solace of his doomed companions? Her heart went out to them all in aching pity, even to poor Smetan, her craven musician. It was so cruel, so cruel to crush them all with this calumny. Norris, for whom little mad Shelton had cried herself to sleep, and Weston, whose young wife must be wrung with grief, and honest Brereton, her faithful watchdog, as she had called him. A straying gleam of memory brought a sudden picture of those three, arms linked about each other, glasses on high towards the king, joyously toasting him his sweetheart, fair Anne Boleyn. Her friendship had cost them dear, thought the woman in the tower. She believed herself done with hope forever, yet she was to know once more the rack of its suspense. That next morning Cranmer came to her, Cranmer the archbishop she had made, and whose allegiance she had so widely counted upon. Now he told her of his sympathy and his helplessness how he had written anxiously to the king protesting his belief in her, but how the fear of the king had forced his outward acquiescence. Now, he assured her, he found a way to save her. Henry desired a divorce. Despairing of heaven's sending him a son, he had resolved to make the Duke of Richmond his heir. Whose daughter had married Richmond had been influential doubtless in the matter. Well, to do this, he wished to make Elizabeth illegitimate. How could he? 
He refused to admit himself in the wrong and his marriage invalid on account of Catherine, but sought to invalidate it for some other reason. The old matter of the pre-contract between Percy and Anne had been brought up, but the very day after the condemnation of the four men, Northumberland had sworn upon the sacrament that no pre-contract existed. The wary earl had no notion of contradicting his former oath and laying himself open to a charge of treason. But would not Anne admit that contract, on consideration that her life was spared? My life! said Anne, with a weary note of contempt, and yet the blood that had seemed congealed in her veins like frozen ice seemed to quiver and flow again in the involuntary resurgence of her youth, but she shook her head. Percy shall ne'er go hang for me, she vowed. Cranmere besought her in vain, pleading her desperate straits. Nay, ye need urge me no more, she declared. I will ne'er undo Northumberland. But there is another reason I will own to, and you can promise me that life will come of it. Life. I had not thought I cared to live, but now it seems that something in me is still eager to draw breath and look up at the sky, be it in that wilderness of the new country across the seas which that Genoese Columbus sailed to. Yes, I will make the bargain. My life for my unwiving. For if the king is set on making out his daughter illegitimate, "'Tis the same boat that all the rest are in. "'He will do so in spite of me. "'Take oath upon it. "'But that sickly lad of his will never reign, "'and then will come my child's chance. "'But, oh, Cranmer, "'I have grown fearful that thrones "'are not such pinnacles of fortunes. "'You will be friendly to my child? "'The reason? "'Why, turn your mind back, my lord, "'to some dalliances of Henry "'before I was betrothed to him.' and ye may surmise a reason for invalidating this marriage of mine that I procured with so great weariness, and now undo with but a little breath. Do you recall my sister Mary? She was very fair. Cranmer nodded. But had not his highness a dispensation for, for that degree of consanguinity? Aye, but Rome is not the fountainhead of our conscience any more. If I wished to contest true, I would have a shrewd case. But I will not contest but so much as may make my safety worth my concession. I will own I knew of this affair, and then the knowledge by both parties of an opposing reason maketh the offspring illegitimate. Will that satisfy them, Master Cranmer? And shall I sure go free? He promised it and the will to live sprang up in her pitiful eagerness. She told her maids of Cranmer's assurance that she would probably be sent in exile to the low countries, and upheld her spirit with the ring of her words. She made new plans, dreamed new hopes of a quiet life somewhere, of books and flowers, and perhaps again the sight of her child. She might have spared herself the pains." She seemed scarcely to have fallen asleep that night before a noise roused her. The room was gray with the first faint lightening of dawn, and the casement framed a patch of lilac sky. The noise came again, a crash of board and then a regular click-clack of business-like regularity. She went to the window on the west, and in the dim light she saw the figures of men at work in the courtyard below. They were building something and the dreadful truth flashed through her. They were making a scaffold. Was she to die at once? Lady Kingston, entering some two hours later, when the sun was flooding the room with light, and finding Anne ready-gowned in pallid readiness, informed her that this was not yet for her, but for the men who were to die. Beneath my window, said Anne, with ghastly eyes. The people had come in great numbers, they poured in before the workmen had finished their job, men and women and even children, animated with the tingling excitement of the execution. They streamed in increasing throng. Anne heard the babble of their incessant talk, the medley of laughter and banter and inquiry and gossip that filled the air. It was a memorable occasion for them. Those children that they had roused from their beds to come would long remember it, and tell their children's children of the day they had seen die 
five lovers of a guilty queen smeton was to be hanged being of ignoble birth the other four were to be beheaded the sun that shone so brilliantly at first slipped away behind a thin cloud and left the morning but faintly luminous with the milky opaqueness of an opal flashing an occasional spark of brightness one such ray slipped out and briefly gilded the heads of the condemned men as anne kneeling at her window through the endless hours saw them led out to die they were led punctiliously in the order of their rank her brother in advance something seemed to stir and quiver in anne's side as if her heart felt the stab of a mortal wound then she was quiet very quiet in a still and frozen calm she saw the men mount the scaffold and stand beside that menacing figure that leaned with rolled-up sleeves upon an axe she saw the composure with which the four gentlemen surveyed this figure and then turned to face the mob before them she became aware of the faces of curious onlookers appearing along the tower wall peering in between the spikes uncanny apparitions like bodiless heads set in a row with the grin of life surprised still upon their lips she saw young smeton shrink back and cover his face at the sight of the gallows arm that was to dispatch him when the gentlemen's affairs had been concluded after a brief colloquy between the figures on the scaffold anne saw her brother step forth there was a tightening of the indescribable tension throughout her rigid body but anne felt nothing more she seemed encased in stone her brother was speaking but the wind blew the words away and only occasional sentences reached her ears she knew there was little he could say for a condemned man to protest his innocence and denounce the king's justice was to invite torture instead of beheading a confiscation of all his goods and the wreaking of the king's displeasure upon his family not to preach but to die came george's voice desiring all and especially masters of the court that ye will trust in god especially and not in the vanities of this world for if i had done so i think i had been alive as ye be now forgive me whom i have offended as i forgive all god save the king he concluded mechanically the executioner stepped forward he said something and george knelt and never once looked up and said farewell the sister thought in her dumb agony they had refused her permission to see him yesterday night the executioner raised his axe she did not stir or quiver at the hideous scene she could not move or shed a tear she could not even hide her face she became vaguely aware of mary and helen crouching beside her with muffled sobs of madge swooning at their feet but she could not turn a head to them her eyes were tense upon that thinning group she saw weston step to his place and wave his hand down at a young woman who held up a little child it was his wife and son it seemed but yesterday that anne had seen them wed and now how soon it was all over it was a nightmare of blood those strong young men stepping forward in their youth and strength that swinging axe, and then those headless trunks, blood-spurting necks, and those severed heads rolling on the greasy boards. At last she raised her eyes to the women who were bending over her. It was all finished. "'Their souls are gone straight to heaven,' said Anne slowly, in a voice from which all color of life was extinct. She roused at Kingston's entry to face him with— and not one word of admission, not at the last. And Smeton, that poor, rack-wrung lad, did he not acquit me of the infamy he had laid upon me? He said not, madam, Kingston replied. It seemed that her white cheek turned whiter. She laid her hand upon her heart. Alas, my lord, I fear his soul will suffer for it. That afternoon she was told that her case had been tried at Lambeth and Cranmer had pronounced an annulment. There was no word of pardon, and what poor assurance she had secretly clung to was extinguished in a blaze of bitter comprehension. The advocates, to whom Cranmer had urged her to assign her cause, had betrayed her through too ready yielding. 
Had they stood out, the king might have been forced to come to terms with her. But they were royal officials, eager to please their sovereign. Had not Thomas Cromwell frankly stated that the duty of politicians is to penetrate the disguise which sovereigns are accustomed to throw over their real inclinations, and to devise the most specious expedients by which they may gratify appetites, without appearing to outrage morality or religion. And here these politicians had no disguise of Henry's appetites to penetrate. They promptly yielded, and with their case went Anne's last hope, for though she was pronounced now to have been no lawful wife of Henry's, and so could not be logically sentenced for betraying a husband who denied the relationship, logic had no voice in the affair. Kingston informed her that the execution was fixed for the morning of the 18th. Why, tis tomorrow, she repeated incredulously. She was very merry at dinner. Lord, Lord, the long faces, she cried, gazing about on her ladies. Ye are the girls whose cheer I craved, and now look on yourselves. Why do ye weep? There is no more to fear. And think what strange history you are seeing. There will be ballads and tales writ about me. Wyatt will make some, I warrant. I shall not lack for a name. Tell my chroniclers that I proffer them Queen Anne sans tête. Queen Lackhead, that is, Madge. You never knew your French. Is there no more of the pigeon? Think. Tis the last that I shall eat. In eerie gaiety her laughter rang out and her talk rattled on with desperate jest. Yet when the meal was over, she went quickly from them to her prayer closet, and knelt there alone, pressing her hands over the throbbing temples. O oh God, O oh God, she whispered, it is true, it is real, I must die. She repeated it over and over, closing her eyes as if to shut out the horrid pictures that swam in blood before her. Phrases and words of grief floated through her mind and fixed themselves into lines. Presently, her ladies heard the sound of a lute from her chamber, and entering, discovered her at the window, softly singing. "'Tis a verse of my own making,' she told them dreamily. "'Listen, you may not hear me sing again. "'O oh, death, rock me asleep, bring on my quiet rest. "'Let pass my very guiltless ghost out of my careful breast. "'Ring out the doleful knell.' Let it sound my death tell, for I must die, there is no remedy, for now I die. My pains who can express, alas, they are so strong, my dollar will not suffer strength, my life for to prolong. Alone in prison strange, I wail my destiny, woe worth this cruel hap, that I should taste this misery. Farewell my pleasures past, welcome my present pain. I feel my torments so increase that life cannot remain. Sound now the passing bell. Rung is my doleful knell. For its sound my death doth tell. Death doth draw nigh. Sound the knell dolefully. For now I die. And again she sang. Defiled is my name full sore. Through cruel spite and false report. That I may say for evermore farewell to joy. Adieu, comfort. She continued playing slow, bell-like dirge notes on her lute, staring absently out the window. It was open, and the night had grown misty. A rising wind played with her hair which she had allowed that night to fall as she used in the days when she was maid of honor. It bloweth chill upon you, Mary said anxiously, and Anne laughed. What matter? Mary looked confused. What matter, indeed, how chill the wind blew on Anne, or how much cold she grew now? Anne laughed on sharply, and then sobered. Is it not strange, she said, frowning thoughtfully, as if trying to reason out a curious puzzle within herself, that tomorrow you will be here, and you, Helen, and Madge, all alive somewhere, combing your hair, looking out that a chill wind blow not too sharply upon you, and I, I, this happiest of women, shall be... where? In heaven, said Mary Wyatt in a trembling voice. Anne smiled gravely at her. Why, so I truly think myself. I have had but faults, not crimes. 
and this martyrdom should atone for much more than can ever be truthfully laid to me. If there is a heaven, I think I shall win to it, and if there be nothing, for these thoughts come to those who are about to die, why then I shall know nothing and sleep on with the dust in the earth's keeping. Say not such things, Anne, begged Mary, crossing herself. Not at this time. Little Trembler, if you shiver so at a word, how will you have courage to stand beside me on the scaffold? Besides, if the thought is in the heart, doth not the Lord know all hearts, and doth he not read it, and respect more an open speech than a hypocritical silence? But no, I have no doubt. I think there must be another world, for this is so full of wrong and sin that another world must there be to place things right and undo the work of this. And again I feel that I must go on, somewhere. She put her hand on her heart. It beats so strong, she said. She raised her hand. Hush! Faint notes of music were floating up to them from the dark of the spring night. Barges were passing on the water, laden with pleasure-seekers. The strings of lutes were gaily twanged. Voices rose high in jovial measures. Anne knew the voices. Her own had chimed with them many such a night. It was a song of the king's composition, the one to which Anne had danced some years ago. Past dance with good company, I love, and shall until I die. O poignant memory! She saw the feast of Cardinal Wolsey's, the lights and colors, the brilliant throngs, and before them all aglow with the triumph of her dance, a girl in a sky-blue gown, sparkling with silver stars, Anne remembered how she had embroidered away at those stars. She thought of her first dance with the king that night, and all the vanities and conquests that quickened her young blood and made up the sensation she called life and happiness. How little she had dreamed that night of being queen, how little of a queen dethroned, condemned to die. A medley of strange memories enwrapped her as she sat at the barred window while a rollicking chorus floated in the air about her her husband's voice ringing over all, a bizarre confusion of unsummoned scenes. She saw Henry as he had appeared in the garden at Hever, with the sunlight on his fringe of hair and beard, and again on that wind-swept hill in Epping Forest, when she had first promised to be his queen. She saw his face as he had welcomed her at the tower, the day of her coronation procession in London, smiling on her and kissing her before all the crowd. In strange review past the many days and nights of their association, his passionate words of love, the kisses, the touch of his hands, she remembered how often he had clasped them about her neck, turning her face up to him. She had not dreamed then of a ruder clasp. And now he was going to marry Jane. He passed beneath her window, singing. She doubted if he meant it for an affront. He had probably not remembered her existence. The spring was in his blood, his old, diseased, ulcerous blood, and he was singing of his new love, thrilling of the lust of the new conquest. Passion was all of which he was capable. She remembered what she had wrung from her ladies, the story of the new white satin clothes, trimmed with gold, his wedding clothes that he was to don the next day, incredible, callous, satyr of life and he had written a play on Anne's infidelities and execution that he was reading to his court. It did not seem possible. Her motto danced mockingly before her eyes, happiest of women. At length she went to bed. I had best or my limbs may tremble in spite of me, she acceded to her lady's prayers for her to rest herself. But no sleep could visit that agitated and excited mind. Somewhere in the early morning Helen woke to see Anne sitting in bed, very pale and ghostly looking in the light of the single chamber candle, the shadows of the blown curtains swaying over her like birds of ill omen. Helen rose quickly to know if she might do anything for her. Yes, be thyself, dear Helen, Anne laughed under her breath. Doth it not seem a shame to waste these hours that are the last my mortal tongue can have to wag in converse, in trying to sleep? Let us talk. Let us open our hearts to each other. I always liked the stiff crust of thine. What shall we tell each other? Let us cast all pretense aside. 
See, this time tomorrow morning I shall be unable to betray thee. Helen crept softly into bed with her. Mary lay asleep, the light in her face revealing the traces of her tears. After all, what is there to say? Helen said drearily. There must be many things. Bethink thee that after this sum, bethink thee that after this sun hath risen, one may ask of me in vain. Helen turned her light gray eyes upon her. Didst thou ever love the king? Love is a strange word, Helen. I loved the shadow of the king once, but what I loved was a figment of my mind, a dream of my dazed fancy. But thou, Helen, dost thou not love Wyatt? Helen gave a wan smile. Why should you care to ask? In heaven all is revealed. Then why should I wait a day? A few hours make no difference. I do think you have. Indeed, you think truly. Anne considered it in silence. Why, then, you have had a tragedy of your own, poor girl. I wonder not. Why, it is beyond all others it was e'er our lot to know. Oh, I would, I would that when I came from France he had been free. Free, gave back Helen in a voice tense with feeling. What were freedom or honor or those things that men name virtues if I could have won him? You tossed him aside as one forbidden. My God, how gladly I would have sacrificed all, all for him. Anne was silent a moment. Then she shook her head. You may yet hope, she said. For you all things are not ending. Hope, whispered the other girl ironically. His heart will be buried with you, Anne. He is a man possessed. He hath talked with me before I came here, because he knew that I was true to you, and said over and over that he would give his life for the chance of raising a rescue expedition. He said to me that if all were hopeless, and the end came that he would not let you lie under the stones here in a dishonored grave. He will come and steal you, he said, and carry you by night to a place in Blickling or Hever Churchyard. Anne shivered. I wonder if you can guess how strange my flesh creeps to hear you speak of me as under the stones, when here I sit in my flesh so strong and well. Helen, tis a strange thought that tomorrow night this gown will lie here as it was. But I, I shall be no more. The lumber that we call into being, the gear that serves us, is of more lasting stuff. The girls were silent. At length Anne prepared to rise. Call mine almoner. If there is strength in prayer, I will seek it. I would put my mind upon high things. From two o'clock she remained in prayer, trying steadily to compose herself, to face the great ordeal with an inner calmness, as well as the outer fortitude of pride. In the morning she sent for Kingston and asked him to be present while she received the sacrament. The communion was celebrated in both before and after receiving the host she declared upon the salvation of her soul that she had never been unfaithful to the king, and was guiltless of the crimes laid to her charge. Kingston was uneasy under the pitiful ceremony. What is the good? he muttered. In his heart he did not believe her guilty. To him, the man of obedience, it did not matter. The only thing that mattered was that she was going to die and that he must see to the arrangements. Then she returned to the chamber with her maids. She had dressed herself in a low-cut gown and looped her hair away from her neck. So she sat among the four who were to accompany her to the last. "'Thou had best not come, Mary,' she said kindly. "'It will be a sad sight for thee.' Mary looked at her with tear-stained eyes. "'I shall not weep, dear Anne, and trouble thee. But I shall not leave thee,' she said and Mary sat as quietly as Anne in the room, with folded hands and set lips, waiting, waiting. Her look dwelt upon Anne in passionate love. When their eyes met, she smiled, a brave little smile, to show that she was strong and ready. It seemed to Anne she could endure no more. At ten o'clock she sent for Lady Kingston, unable to wait longer in silence. She was not to die before noon, Lady Kingston declared, and Anne rose restlessly and asked to have Kingston himself come to her. Mr. Kingston, she uttered, I hear I shall not die afore noon, 
and I am very sorry, therefore, for I thought to be dead by this time and past my pain. The pain should be very little, said Kingston, with his crude attempt at consolation. It is so subtle. She burst out laughing. I have heard that the executioner is very good, and I have a little neck. Still laughing softly in the face of the astonished man, she clasped her two hands about it. I have seen men, and also women, executed, wrote the governor of the tower in the letter to Cromwell, and they have been in great sorrow, but to my knowledge this lady hath much joy and pleasure in death. Time dragged on. No notice for the execution was given. The swordsman, a Frenchman from Calais, who had a great reputation for dexterity, had been chosen, and it was reported that he was delayed. Again, Lady Kingston said that people were too excited. It was told abroad that the lady was to die that day, and numbers had come to witness it. It was better to wait till they dispersed. There would be few admitted. To Anne's taut nerves, tuned to this funeral, calm, the delay was torture. She began to pace restlessly back and forth in bitter longing to have the terrible ordeal over with and done. Now her thoughts rushed to meet it, picturing each step that she must take up that grim scaffold where she had seen her brother die, playing morbidly with the thought of her last moment. Now they strayed back over the past, and she caught herself irrelevantly, remembering how blue were Elizabeth's eyes and how deep her dimples. She folded against her breast the arms that ached to feel that baby weight in them once more, while she tried to keep at bay the unnerving terrors of her fears for her little one. She was leaving her defenseless, with a shameful stain upon her mother's name. What would become of her? Would Mary wreak her hate on her? At last she sent for Lady Kingston, and commanding her to follow, led her into the great presence chamber. She shut the door and locked it, and then turning to the lady, who stood surprised but tolerant of some new communication, sit upon the seat of state, Anne said quickly. Lady Kingston protested. It is my duty to stand and not sit at all in your presence, much less sit upon that seat which is the seat of you, the Queen. Ah, madam, that title is gone. Anne smiled wearily. I am a condemned person, and by law have no estate left in me in this life but for clearing of my conscience. I pray you sit down. Well, Lady Kingston quizzically returned, I have often played the fool in my youth, and to fulfill your command I will do it once more in mine age. And thereupon she marched to the chair of state, ascended the two steps, seated herself on the chair, with an ironic upward glance at the cloth of state hanging about her. But Anne had no humor in her at that moment. She was desperately in earnest, and schooling her spirit to a scene of penance, she deliberately knelt. She had not knelt since she had received the crown upon her head three years ago that very month. She could not help remembering that torturing fact, fixed as her mind was upon its act of reparation. I charge you, she said in deep earnest, as in the presence of God and his angels, and as you will answer before them when all should appear to judgment, that you will so fall down before the Lady Mary's grace, and in like manner ask her forgiveness for the wrongs I have done her. Till that is accomplished, my conscience will not be quiet. Well, well, then will I, Lady Kingston made answer, and rose with alacrity from the elevation where she felt herself vastly out of place. But there will few believe me when I tell this tale, she added under her breath. The day was interminable to Anne's strained nerves. After that scene in the presence chamber, her mercurial spirits rose in extravagant levity, and she chattered in desperate merriment, laughing and joking of old times. She gave her maids her dresses, and then wondered if they would be allowed to keep them. Or will Queen Jane wish them? She hath ever admired this blue so. She talked of her mother and sent many messages. And so through the night, it was impossible for her to sleep. Do I keep you up? she asked once. Well, you, and in troth, I, shall sleep sound enough by the morrow, and so make all well. End of chapter 33
Chapter thirty four of The Favor of Kings. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Favor of Kings by Mary Hastings Bradley. The End. She had breakfasted next morning when Kingston approached her and stated that the hour was set she heard him with a curious tightening of the nerves as if the instrument of her body were being tuned for its last performance upon earth kingston handed her a purse telling her that according to custom she was to distribute those twenty pounds in alms before her death then anne hastened to make ready shortly before nine he returned and anne and her four ladies with dumb looks of parting strained hand clasps and the touch of cold lips on cold cheeks formed in line and followed him in the hall they paused while he ordered his men in position and anne glancing down found that she was pressing against an old elm chest used there for keeping arrows it had been changed from its old place and stood open now the cover removed anne pointed to it with an ironic smile could you do no better for your queen kingston apologized there being no better provided and time pressing it will serve said anne she gave a swift half fearful glance at the empty chest as she brushed past it in a few moments it would be filled her poor head and disfigured body the lips the limbs that henry had caressed and wrapped with such soft luxury would be huddled into this rough chest there was a terrible smile on her mouth as she stepped into the doorway and faced the sun-flooded courtyard only a few privileged spectators were present for too many mutterings against her fate had been heard among the people and some manifestation was feared the platform that stood in the centre of the green enclosure was so low that the figures upon it could not be seen from without the walls and outside a file of soldiers were keeping the crowds that had haunted the place away anne heard their voices she had paused in the tower doorway looking out on the scene her eyes passing slowly with no sign of recognition save the ironic deepening of that mocking smile over the faces of the courtiers who had come to see her die she stood before them with a mien of exultation it seemed to them that never had they seen the queen in such radiance of beauty she wore a gown of black damask with a deep white cape falling from the neck which was low cut her hair was raised high on her head and adorned with a small headdress of black and silver one that would in no wise obstruct matters she had murmured in its selection she stood etched in black and white save for the feverish brilliance of her cheeks that animated her with a bloom that held some quality of secret terror for the onlookers her very lack of fear was fearful in one so full of life and all its loveliness as kingston still delayed over some last order she turned to the captain of the guard erect and ill at ease beside her and with a sudden gesture unhooked a trinket from her chain and passed it to him that is the first gift that the king e'er gave me she said and as young gwyn with an embarrassed word of thanks was clasping it dumbly his honest eyes speaking the pity that was forbidden his tongue she murmured you will observe there is a serpent in the handle she was silent a moment and then spoke again very clearly though in a quiet voice commend me to his majesty and say that he hath been ever constant in his career of advancing me from a private gentlewoman he made me a marchioness and from a marchioness a queen and now he hath left no higher degree of honour he gives mine innocency the crown of martyrdom the words echoed curiously about the silent group then kingston hurriedly gave the order to advance and with a firm step anne went on on the scaffold she turned to kingston i entreat you not to haste the signal for my death till i have spoken that which is on my mind to kingston bowed he looked ill at ease she turned and faced the little group before her she saw cromwell regarding her with steady attention 
and noticed that he was in particularly fine array doubtless he was to hurry back to join henry at his wedding feast she wondered how soon he was to marry jane seymour's sister and become the king's brother-in-law strange events there was suffolk the king's other brother-in-law beside him well it was not so difficult to be the king's brother-in-law as it had been there might be several more of them if this continued a step creaked behind her she cast a swift uncontrollable glance over her shoulder dreading that the executioner would stealthily strike her down hastily she began to speak and a tense hush fell upon that little courtyard over that strange gathering of the most powerful men in england who had come to see a queen die for that of which they more than all men living knew that she had never done masters i am come hither to die according to law she began in her clear penetrating tones with their singing carrying quality which made men keep them long in memory for by the law i am indeed to die and therefore i will speak nothing against it i am come hither to accuse no man and her glance for a moment rested on cromwell's face staring fixedly up at her nor to speak anything whereof i am accused as i know full well that aught that i could say in my defence doth not appertain unto you and that i could draw no hope of life from the same but i come here only to die and to yield myself unto the will of my lord the king i pray god to save the king and to send him long to reign over you again there was a slight pause then the people too accustomed to hearing the king extolled by those whom he had sent to the scaffold suddenly caught their breath at the delicately mocking inflection of those clear tones as they went on smoothly with no word that a censor might disapprove but with a ripple of indescribable irony the most godly noble and gentle prince there is if any person will meddle with my cause i require them to judge the best she added with sudden vehemence and then slowly and softly her gaze passing over those set upturned faces thus i take my leave of the world and of you the quiet voice ceased with a fleeting glance at that waiting figure the bared sword in its hand she turned to her ladies the girls were powerless to aid her their hearts were breaking with the smile she gave them then refusing to have her eyes bound she knelt down and as she knelt she leaned and whispered to mary tell wyatt i send my love to him too late she put her head on the block she felt the pulse of her throat beat frenziedly against it she heard the creak of the executioner's shoes and her brilliant eyes looking back over her shoulder in irresistible fascination saw the man pause as he met her glance and his arm dropped to his side she forced herself to stare steadily ahead in manus tuas she breathed the executioner slipped out of his shoes he motioned an assistant to approach the queen from the other side anne hearing that man draw near turned her eyes involuntarily in his direction from the other side the swordsman stole suddenly upon her then stooping he lifted by the long dark hair and held aloft before them the dangling head of anne who had been queen of england end of chapter thirty four end of the favor of kings by mary hastings bradley